okay, everyone? I'm going to use this microphone in a really dynamic way and welcome you again to the annual meeting. Hilo. Um, Kevin, you're, you're underway. Um, the first thing we want to do is let you know a little bit about this space. Uh, I hope you're familiar with it, but downstairs there are some bathrooms. You need to go, and there's, there's, there's bathrooms all the way down on the bottom floor, and there's down, bathrooms down on the main floor. There are, the exits are as you entered, and also in the case of an emergency, there are emergency exits here. Only use them in the case of an emergency. We are being recorded tonight by the fine folks from Orca, so you can get a replay of this, and friends who cannot attend tonight or are going to be able to see it. And now, I'd like to quickly introduce uh, the Council of the Hunger Mountain Co-op. If everybody would please stand. Is everybody assembled? Yes, good. So, I don't think this is really alphabetical, but maybe it is. Uh, Bertel Agel and Scott Hess, Ashley Hill, Mark McCaskey, Rita Ricketson, Stephen Farnham, Carl Etnire. Thank them for what you've done. Yeah, thank them. And I want to let you know that the, uh, can the candidates for the council election are here, I hope all of them as well. And if they would stand, I'm not sure where they may be seated. Do we have a list of their names? It's Ho 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 Jose Aguayo, where are you? Right there. Okay, there we go. Wave, wave, wave. Who else have we got? Who's uh, Tom Kester waving and good and Suzanne Pratt. Okay, and we have one more. The, you know, I'm not sure. Can we can we do anything with this volume? Okay, I'll do it this way. We won't really use. All right, I'll, I'll try and talk this way. All right. So, uh, uh, Stephen Farnham is running again, so he should stand also. And Eric Jacobson, if you are here, I don't know if he is. He just stepped out. Okay. And Patrice. Okay. So those are our uh, folks for election. Now, the ballot boxes for council election are still open. They will close at the end of this meeting. Electronic voting is also available, and it closes at 8 p.m. tonight no, when this meeting is adjourned or scheduled to be adjourned. Now, uh, another good point, we have some raffles going on over there. I want to let everyone understand that you need to be present to win the raffle. Stay till the end of the meeting when the raffles are drawn. Now, I'm going to check with Kari, who has already told me this, but uh, we want to verify that we have a quorum, and we do. We have 229 members registered. 229 members, at least, are in here. Okay, so we do have a quorum. And now, we would like to approve the 2016 annual meeting minutes. And so I will entertain a motion to approve them. The minutes themselves were on that table back there for everyone to read. Uh, if there is a motion, and would you give me your name? Mary Alice Bixby? Bisbee. Bisbee, okay. Uh, is there a second? And Michael Billingsley seconded the motion. It is not. We are in discussion, and so please submit your correction. Uh, Why don't you give us your name? I've got a paper. Okay. Do you want me to tell you? Uh, you can bring it up here so it can be handed to the note taker. Um, where is our note taker? Thanks for reading them carefully. And we will, we will turn this in, okay. Uh, and what's your name? Put, Alec, you want to put your name on there? Okay, very good. Uh, now, I think the normal thing is that I need to read that uh, no, so that it's approval with that, correct? I missed the perspective yeah, that I was Yeah, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to read this to you. 
Uh, and so this is a correction that he wants. I did not stand up to give my own perspective as this says. I stood up to inform my fellow owners of an official report of moral issues given by the staff representative to the council during the August 29, 2016 council meeting. I confirmed, having heard firsthand from individual staff members, specific accounts anger me, and I believe they would anger most of the people in this room, but I was not sharing that to present my perspective, but to confirm an official report, and these minutes omit that crucial point. What these minutes should say is, I was informing the owner body that a problem in staff morale was presented to the council in the August 29, 2016 council meeting. So we would be revising the minutes to incorporate this statement. Uh, that is what we would now be voting on. Are there any other comments or discussion about the minutes of last year's meeting? I'm going to call for a vote. And I think a vote voice, a voice vote will be sufficient. All those in favor of approving the minutes with this correction, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Aye. Any abstain? It's the sense that the motion has passed and the minutes are approved. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. All right. <coughs> Uh, now, we, yeah. is, is, is Aaron Galligan Baldwin here? Oh, this is a development. <laughs> um, can you do it? Okay. We're gonna, we're gonna do it. It's the co-op. We can cooperate. We can make it happen. The minutes will get taken. All right. You may need. We may need more paper for her. Okay. Now we'd like to announce the winners or the recipients. I should say the recipients of the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Fund Grant Awards. This is funding that we collect and uh, award to worthy groups. And we're going to introduce the committee member, one of the committee members, Claire Wheeler, who is going to list the recipients and briefly uh, state their projects. We'll be speaking to them at more length at the end of the meeting. So if Claire would come forward. Oh, here we go. Hello. Hey, take this. And really, these are Really, really. Hello, everybody. I'm Claire. Good evening. How's the food? So the Hunger Mountain Co-op Community Fund was started in 2005 to offer financial support to organizations, businesses, and initiatives aligned with our co-op's mission. And it was a great year. We were really gratified to receive 29 very worthy applications this year. And we're very happy to announce that we were able to award $6,600 in grants to nine very deserving, hardworking local organizations. So that's pretty awesome, right? So just to give you a sense of how the fund works, if you haven't heard of it before, it's very much up and coming and exciting. Uh, the fund is supported by donations from members as well as from the co-op's operating budget. Um, sorry, the operations. Um, so thank you to, of those of you, to those of you who made a donation uh, to the fund. And this year also the council elected to donate uncashed patronage refunds to the fund, which was a big help. With these funds, the co-op is able to support projects that we know are making a real difference in our community, and we'll tell you about what those projects are in just a second. So uh, the advisory fund, the committee that works on this project, is made up of member owners like myself, volunteers, council members, and staff. And uh, the way it works is that we make recommendations to the council, and the council ultimately gives final approval. Uh, generally, our criteria include alignment with the co-op mission, uh, the anticipated project impact and the applicant's access to other resources. So because our fund is at right now quite small, we, uh, we really work on focusing our efforts on uh, our grants being able to make a big impact for these, for these organizations. 
Um, so we took photos earlier, I think, with all of the recipients. Thank you all for being here. And uh, I'm going to just kind of run through uh, all of the excellent work that, they're, that they've been doing. Um, and but just ask that any representatives from those organizations please just be stand, stand and be acknowledged as I mention your organization's name. I think we have a slide happening. So first, the Barry Area Senior Center. Uh, congratulations. Thank you so much. Received $500 for their cooking class series, incorporating local and healthy food. Uh, also, Capstone Community Action, doing a project on shelving for food pantry storage. Congratulations. Thank you. Good Food, Good Medicine, doing their Good Food, Good Medicine program, family wellness education. Excellent work. NOFA Vermont, doing their Food for All Low Income CSA Share Support. Excellent work. The Vermont Food Bank for their uh, excellent Veggie Van Gogh uh, project in Barrie City School. So thank you to all these fine recipients. Lots of awesome work happening with food justice and access, which is incredible. And uh, the next slide. Uh, the Growing Peace Project, doing a teaching garden, gleaning, and education around local food. Just Basics, Inc., Montpelier Food Pantry Recipe Kits. The Callis Ag Committee and the Callis Climate Action Team working on materials and supplies for their um, newly established Gospel Hollow Edible Park. Go check it out, Callis. And finally, the Northfield Community Development Network, working on a night on the commons, doing a, a celebration of local foods. So thank you all so much. It's a real pleasure to do this work and to give back to the community in this very uh, concrete and tangible way. So thanks all for your support. Thank you, Claire. You know, as we were getting started here, oh, I have a better microphone now, don't I? Uh, I want to let you know, I'm Alex Brown. I'm the president of the Hunger Mountain uh, Co-op Council. And again, welcome. Now we're up to a stage where we're going to have some brief reports on what the co-op accomplished this last year. And uh, it, you're going to be hearing from me, from our treasurer, Scott Hess, and from our general manager, Kari Bradley. So, we'll look at our reports. Um, we, we, uh, we also hope you take a look at the uh, annual impact report that also talks about some other accomplishments. Our product mix increasingly emphasizes healthy food. We have defined fresh food as the items you see in that pie, produce, meat and fish, deli, cheese, and refrigerated food. That now constitutes 45% of what we sell at the co-op. And overall, fresh food has been growing in sales by about 3% annually. So our community wants this food, we're supplying this food, it's a good direction to go in. We've seen increases in organic and produce sales, but bulk food is down, shop in bulk. Next slide. We wanted to talk to you about local products. We have over 500 local vendors and their businesses are stronger because we provide a sales channel for their food. Together, we are really making this market in local food, and you are participating by buying it and by supporting the co-op. Local food is now about 40% of all sales, and that is a new high. And there's more. We now rank number one of all Northeast co-ops uh, for the percent of sales that come from local food. We even have a pretty tough definition of what's local, by the way, so this is good. Um, so, uh, a great story and it's only getting better. Okay, ready for next? Now, let's talk about Co-op in the Community. We've definitely seen that wonderful story that Claire was talking about of what the Community Fund does, and all of you help support, the, support that. Also, in supporting the Co-op, you're part of various donations and sponsorships. Those grew about 20% in the last year. 
One of the big reasons they grew is some of the things that you do almost unconsciously by doing bag that bag and give change. You're giving more, you're sharing more, you're making the co-op more able to su support the general community. So that's a change that you absolutely are responsible for. In addition, by the way, we've given away food rescue donations. That's not even counted in the dollar amounts. That's food that we provide. Okay, next. And finally, I have to be very honest with you. I don't think you will be too impressed by your patronage refund check, generally speaking. It's not a big deal. But here's what I hope you are impressed by. I hope you're impressed by the dollar impact this co-op has on the community. Our total sales were 24 million last year, but we have, uh, economists have come up with ways of calculating the impact of a local business, and specifically a local food co-op. And the total economic impact of what the co-op brought into the economy of this immediate area is $39.4 million. You made that come true by shopping at the co-op, by investing in the co-op. And it's, a, it's, it's very important to compare it with what a business like Shaw's or Hannaford does. Those businesses, uh, analysts have been able to figure out, contribute about uh, 1.35 times their sales into the community. And that, that multiplier is based on their employees buying things. A co-op like ours, contributes 1.65. It's a much bigger footprint than a, a conventional grocery store would have. So again, that's something that you can all be proud of. Our impact grows and reaches out to so many people because we use a business model and we, use, and we are present in the community. We're local and we aren't going anywhere. Okay, time for Scott. <clears throat> Thank you, Alex. Uh, my name is Scott Hess, I'm the treasurer. I've got a few short um, slides to uh, explain to you. And if we have any more detailed um, questions, our CFO, our fine CFO, Tim Wingate's here, and Carl, who can certainly answer some questions. Uh, sales growth. Uh, sales growth for the last couple of years, as we discussed last year, was a bit anemic um, at a little less than 1%. Things have looked up a little bit, 2.4% which from a, a food inflation perspective is not wonderful, but certainly better than last year. Um, food sales from co-ops across the country have certainly leveled off and, uh, and we're actually doing much better than, than many other co-ops in the country, uh, but still is not nearly the growth that we used to see. Uh, net sales, um, 23.9 million, almost 24 million. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see it, but in the red is the employee expense expenses with benefits and, uh, and health care comes to 28%. Total so cost of goods, uh, 63%. And um, patronage refund is about 1%, depreciation a couple of percent. And our net income that says zero there um, out of our almost 25, $24 million in sales uh, is about $150,000-ish. So we are, although we are a for-profit company, Yes? The percentage is, it says zero because it's so small. Okay, sure. Employee expense, 28%. Cost of goods, 63%. Depreciation, 2%. Other operating expenses is 6%. Uh, patronage refund is about 1%. And total income, we, we're putting it zero because $150,000 divided by almost 24 million is quite small. So although we are a, um, a co-op, I almost feel that we're almost run it as a, uh, as a non-profit, which is how this organization should be run. Any questions about any of that? Okay. Our patronage refund. Uh, our total uh, amount that we were able to uh, declare this year, potentially, well, the total refund declared was 134,362. Uh, uh, Out of that, we're mandated to give, uh, 
At least 20% um, is mandated to give back to members. Last year, I believe it was around 60%, but the council uh, this year decided to give back 50% of that. The other 50% is gonna go to um, back into retained earnings, which will be going back into the co-op, either in, in uh, capital, uh, whether it's you know buying new freezers or just back into retained earnings. So we decided to give 50% this year. Um, current ratio, which is you know, uh, a really good model, current assets divided by current liabilities, and we're really doing well because the higher number is the better as we, as we manage our, our, uh, our income versus the, uh, the money that we're out on a shorter term basis is, gone, is slowly gone up. So that's a, that's a healthy number. And, uh, and our fine conservative management um, is, is, is showing up and, and working out quite well. <clears throat> liability versus equity, the amount of money we owe versus the equity. This has also been going down as we draw down the debt and we raise more money from, um, from members' equity, retained earnings. It's a positive number as it's going down. Um, last year it was uh, obviously just under 1%, 0.9%, almost 0.9%, a little over 1%. Very positive. Uh, it's just showing much healthier uh, financial condition as that number goes down. And that's all. Any questions? Certainly we can answer them. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kari Bradley. I'm your general manager. I want to thank you. <clears throat> thank you for being here. I think this is my 14th annual meeting at Hunger Mountain Co-op. And uh, definitely the best turnout. I think that 229 number was low. Some people probably slipped in without registering. So. On with the slides, please. I'm gonna just round out. You've gotten some information. There's more information in the impact report. If you really like this stuff, there's a 25-page version of it uh, posted to the website called the ENDS report. I've just got a few more things to, to round it out. So we care about environmental impact, and one of the things we measure is our electrical usage. This graph shows that we have been using less kilowatt hours of electricity over time. Last year, we had just a little over, a little under 625,000 kilowatt hours. Grocery stores use a lot of electricity uh, for refrigeration and for lighting. But we've been doing better. We've been improving by investing in new equipment, LED lighting, new refrigeration, and, we're, and that's making a difference. We can expect that can, trend to continue. The other thing that we got into, this doesn't reflect the fact that uh, we are now generating uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, solar electricity from our solar carport. Last year we started in March and we generated about 0.7% um, of our annual usage. So over a 12 month period, we're gonna offset about 2% of our annual electricity needs. Next slide, please. This, uh, this slide shows the increase in the number of co-op member owners over time. Over the past 10 years, we've gone from under 5,000 to a little over 8,600 co-op member owners. Montpelier, of course, is a little less than 8,000 people. And Washington County is estimated to be uh, just around 60,000 now. So as I like to say, more than one in 10 man, woman, and child in this county is an owner of this co-op. So. So the mission statement talks about a dynamic community and the, um, some other ways that we measure community. We have our employees, of course. They're the folks that make the co-op work. Uh, 164 employees last year. 78% of those are member owners of the co-op. Uh, we do an annual satisfaction survey, and last year there was 90% of the um, the survey categories received a good or better average score. 90% is good, but it was actually an eight point decline from the previous year, so this reflects that not everything improves every year. It, we try to keep things in balance, and this is an area where we need to do more work. Uh, Alex mentioned before that we have 502 Vermont vendors. That's goods and services. Um, and what that, the reason that's important is because it translates into purchasing and to that economic impact. So uh, $8.7 million in purchases, um, that's part of that impact that's going back into the local economy. Uh, customers, we had 617,000 transactions last year. A lot of business going through the, through the store, a lot of people. And education is part of our uh, mission as well. And last year we had almost a 10% increase in workshop attendees. 
And another way we define community is a co-ops. We can, we can make a difference by helping other co-ops succeed, especially local co-ops. One of the ways we do that is we invest in other co-ops. Last year, for example, we became a member of the Mooresville Food Co-op and made an investment in that co-op. Um, we, we're doing many other things to, to help the Morrisville Co-op since they opened in September. But investment is a piece of it, and you can see that in this slide we've been investing more over time. Um, this, it, these are investments, they're not donations. We expect to get this money back, and we get some sort of return on them. But it's a way to use our assets to further cooperative development. Now, one, um, one more point on that. Um, we, for the first time last year, measured how much of our product sale comes from other co-ops. So you look at Equal Exchange and uh, Cabot Creamery and Organic Valley. And I was really surprised. Uh, uh, over a million dollars in sales come from co-op made products. Not our products, but other people's co-op. That's about 5% of total sales. So that's uh, pretty impressive and, and, and says we're making a difference in the co-op economy. Okay, that's it for data. I was just gonna give a quick update on where we're at with our co-op conversations. Over this past year, we've been focusing our uh, conversations on member discounts. This is spurred by, in recent years, we've seen some pretty dramatic growth in what's being allocated to member discounts. And back in January and February, we, we, sh we did a series of meetings and interviews and um, shared background information and then took some initial input in into um, what should be, be done, if anything. And we took that, I'll, I'll say that the, it was fairly clear some of the things that we heard in those, that first round. Uh, for one, people were very interested in using the discount program to enhance access to healthy foods in the community, um, especially for low-income folks. Okay, and then there were all, with that, there was some openness to making a change to the senior discount program in order to, to do that, to enhance access um, in the community. So we, the, we have a committee that's made up of council members, members at large, and staff. We took that input, we came up with a set of five recommendations, draft recommendations, brought that back out in June, and did another series of meetings, interviews, and a survey. The summary report from that um, second round is, is uh, posted online now. You can look on the Co-op's website. And there, the, the feedback was much more mixed. Um, so for example, one of the recommendations was to uh, change the criteria, enhance the criteria for the Co-op Cares discount program, which is designed for low-income members. So people were broadly supportive of, of doing that, enhancing the criteria. Um, but there was not widespread support for one of the recommendations, which was to basically grandparent in the members that are receiving the senior discount now and then discontinue the program going forward. So, um, so we're going to take, basically all this input has to go back to the committee. Uh, they're going to meet in November. Um, we'll see if they um, can finalize their recommendations, um, may need a second meeting. Um, and then the, when they um, are done, they will turn those recommendations over to the management team, which will make the final decision. That could happen in early 2018, um, but we'll keep you posted. So I think that's it for the, this part of the presentation, and we're going to open it up to questions and comments. And you're gonna mark. Yeah. All right, now what we want to do is have, uh, we, we're allocating about a half an hour so we can really have a good discussion and do, co collect some good comments from you in here. Um, I'd, I'd like to start this with uh, a comment from Michael Billingsley. So I, 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 this isn't a plan, it's just something he asked me to do. So we will, we will entertain his observation and then we'll go into regular Q&A. Um, I'll try to make this simple. In the um, last year, as a change at the annual meeting, alcoholic beverages were served. And I know for some people that's probably a very small deal and maybe even preferable. But since this is a business meeting in which we are decision making and becoming um, aware in some cases of some fairly complex divisions of opinion and choosing between choices, I was liking to know if in fact the members would agree to having these meetings be alcohol free that the annual meeting and special meetings that alcohol not be served it's not because i have any 
particular uh, adversity to alcohol, but just that I do not think it goes with um, critical decision making. Uh, let's, do we have some people to carry mics around. Uh, there's a comment over there uh, and a comment over there. Oh, good. You. Right here, Matt. Oh. Uh, my name is Alexandra Thayer, Sasha Thayer. I'd like to add something to Michael's suggestion. Um, when I was the chair of the Unitarian Church Board, one of the things we talked about was that we don't know who among us is wrestling with the challenge of problems with alcohol or drugs. And so our decision was to make the church alcohol free. And I think we are in the same constellation here. And um, as much as my husband likes beer, <laughs> he doesn't happen to be here, um, and many other people like beer and wine, I think that we would do better to just not have that be part of the meetings, as well as for the reasons Michael suggested. Another comment over there? And then there'll be one down. I'm gonna call on you next, okay? Well, <clears throat> this, this is a comment in terms of wanting to acknowledge the support of Kari and all of the people here who've helped the MoCo co-op in Morrisville become a mm -hmm. reality. I live in Morrisville and I've been helping there and I'm very involved. And it's been, and I'm a member here for many years. I'm a, I'm a member here for many years, and I just want to acknowledge how Kari and all the staff were so supportive, both personally, financially, and it's really wonderful because we need more co-ops throughout the whole country. And it's great that co-ops can be so really kind and supportive of other new co-ops. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> My name is Irvin Eisenberg. Um, I wanted to express the appreciation first for um, the amount of energy going into giving discounts for those who can't afford things as much. Um, I noticed on the bulletin board the other day discussion about WIC. And it looks like, um, it was about six weeks ago, it said um, something to the effect of that you're thinking of actually being able to accept WIC at the co-op which I think would be really great in keeping with our mission statement. And I just was, my question is, um, where are we in that process? Yeah. Good, and, and I don't think we're done with the alcohol discussion. We'll get back to that, but since this is on the table. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. This has been a, um, a tough one for the co-op. Uh, about a year and a half ago, the WIC program changed. The, the co-op has always accepted WIC. It used to, it used to when it went to the retail, um, uh, format. Um, there were certain products that were accepted. Um, I believe it was produce and um, and dairy products that you could that a person with WIC benefits could purchase at a retail setting. A year and a half ago, it, was, it changed so that all all WIC um, uh, benefits would be go, going through retail. So it used to be that WIC would be distributed, in at least in part, um, by by product that was delivered. So it's all going through retail and Vermont was quick to jump on board that trend and in fact in a lot of people's opinion too quick because the technology was not there to support that the way those WIC benefits are processed are like other um, like like three squares Vermont um, or a debit card or a credit card and we have not had a, a credit card processing technology that can accept WIC benefits and that's so why we've been a year and a half now very frustrating without being able to accept WIC benefits we recently changed credit, uh, credit card service providers for the express purpose of being able to um, accept those. Um, there is a hang up with gift cards. I, I expect it to happen any time now, but um, hang in there. Um, we're getting close. We have a comment down there. Hi, this is in response to the alcohol-free uh, meeting, um, annual meeting, and I don't drink, but my feeling is I don't think that the one drink ticket is going to be uh, uh, impairing anybody's decision during this process, and, and that was all I really wanted to say on that. Thank you. Uh, are there other comments? Uh, uh, we do want to do a full Q&A, but we might want to see... Uh, does anybody have a comment on the issue of alcohol so we can kind of complete that topic and develop your responses to that? Is there other comments on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll go down. Uh, Just to quickly kind of put this to bed, 
what would be the process for changing this for next year's annual meeting? Because we can't, the horse is out of the barn. We can't <laughs> change it tonight. So what would be the process to change it for next year? And may I speak to that? Uh, uh, the answer is the annual meeting is planned and uh, the council uh, usually has a committee that works on this too, but the council overall makes a decision about what we will offer in general. And so this recommendation about uh, serving alcohol is something that the council would decide. And we do want to hear your opinions. Most of the themes that have come up so far actually have been voiced at the council. We're, we're aware. Um, just so that you understand, one thing the council was trying to do in serving alcohol was suggest that we are welcoming you here, that we are trying to offer you something that's also sold at the co-op and something that indicates that we want you to feel very welcome. But we, we know that there is a tricky edge here and that alcohol has a lot of implications. So it's, it's a toughie. Um, what we're hearing tonight from Michael and from another speaker is that perhaps we should cease doing this. And if anybody wants it, it further to speak for it, uh, you may, and council will take it under consideration. I, I would like to continue offering one beverage per person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a limitation. It was very, very conscious because it was intended to be just a gesture as opposed to anything deeper. Uh, yes. A lot of our uh, local community has been observing, you know, uh, having beer as a product, and we have a lot of things like that. And so I see, in some ways, the one beer a person or one drink a person is sort of also including them in the uh, in all of those growers and people have, have done in part of this event. So I don't drink either, but I actually love the one drink a person policy. Other comments? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, uh, that was Stephen Klein. Peter Kalman. Okay. Why don't we just take a quick uh, straw vote so you can see not just a few people talking, but see what the sense is. All right, that's a good idea. I think, are we ready for that now? Is everybody satisfied? All right, I'd like to ask, uh, I'm going to give you a chance to vote for allowing one drink per person at next year's annual meeting. Those in favor of offering one drink per person at next year's annual meeting, say aye. Aye. Those opposed to offering one drink a person? Aye. Or that would be a nay, but no, okay. That, that's fine. That's fine. I, did. I, I am going to say that my sense of the room is that there are still a majority of people who consider is it a good idea. It is clear that we have to do it with a lot of delicacy. We've tried to do that. But we need to be responsible and aware of all the implications of this. It's a tough line. Uh, but I appreciate getting this feedback on this topic so that, so that the council can consider it next year. Other questions about the, oh look, there's somebody so far away, but run, run, run with your microphone. Run, run, run. <laughs> Are we done speaking about the alcohol? Uh, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. I've uh, been an owner for 12 years and a staff member for three. And I would like to address the issue of staff morale. Uh, Kari just presented the all staff meeting just the other day, and morale is down 8%. And I think that survey was done before the negotiation committee. Uh, we had to negotiate our new contract. Um, I can say that when the management says that there's a small turnover of employees at the co op, I have not witnessed that in our particular department. Uh, we have 10 employees on our department, and the three years that I've worked there, seven people have changed over, uh, including the manager, and two people have left due to stressful situations working at the co-op. I've recently been to two doctors and have been advised by both my healthcare practitioners that I should consider leaving my job due to stress. I certainly hope that the members that I speak to on the floor every day uh, are concerned about how the staff are treated, um, which is why I bring it up at this um, meeting. I will be addressing uh, further statistics to the council very soon, but I certainly hope that the members understand that when I moved to Vermont and fulfilled my dream to move to Vermont, I wasn't expecting that my medical care doctors were gonna tell me that I shouldn't be working at the co-op because of the stress. I believe we can change it. I just think enough people need to care about it. So I'm asking the members to care so that the council cares, so that management can care. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Comment right over there. Could yeah. Put your tell us your name. Andrea Stefani. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, due to stress, which I not my own, uh, but which I observed, which I observed, um, not used to a microphone. Sorry. Up here. Okay. Um, I have many times suggested, put in a suggestion box, my comments and my wish. Um, I only once got a call for that particular reason back, that um, our co-op should be a pilot project for uh, physical relief of stress for the employees by offering for all cashiers and anybody in the customer service nice office chairs which roll around so that people don't have to stay all the time. Because I've left Europe 35 years ago, at that time already everybody in all the countries I visited all over Europe was sitting in cash registers and in banks. America has somehow this weird attitude that only when people stay, they are supposedly feeling to be looking like working. That is not healthy, there are women, there are many women which get pregnant in their lives there are elderly people which develop all kind of arthritis and so on. The option to sit down and to stay should be up to the person who's working, not to the manager to impose a slave-like behavior. Sorry to mention this, but it really is a weird tradition in America. It's not anywhere else. So I was once told, the one time I got a call back, that had to do with some flooring issues. Well, I doubt that very much. The floors look fine for any rolling office chairs with uh, back support as well. And if anybody who, like me, travels often to Europe can have a look at these situations, I know several people who are here who also are often in Europe, they all will confirm that nobody seems to have an issue with employees sitting and working. So please consider this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You want to comment? Thank you very much. Okay, another comment right there. A woman in a green sweater, and remember to start with your name, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Eva Schachtman, and I want to say thank you to the employees, especially the woman that spoke up. I don't know your name, I'm sorry. But thank you. You know, I've been a member of the Co-op since 1988, and um, I didn't really know that much about the conditions of the staff. I've, I've had blinders on for a long time. But um, in the past year, I've really been paying attention. And I have to tell you that it's not a great situation for the staff here at the co-op. And it's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed um, to be a member for all these years and not have been paying attention. So I just want to say it's our responsibility to pay attention, not just to each other as members, but to the staff who the majority of are also members, um, which is kind of amazing. Um, the fact that um, Staff satisfaction has gone down 8% in the past year. Should be a red flag to anybody that hasn't been paying attention. And I really hope that this um, brings to light something that we really have to work on. Uh, and we really have to um, make sure that the council is uh, aware of what's going on and actually is um, an advocate for the staff and for the well-being of the co-op in general. And if the council is not doing that, then we need to vote in council members who will do that. Um, and if there's some mechanism in the bylaws that prevents the council from doing that, then we need to change the bylaws. Okay? You hear me? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Another comment? 
My name is Alex Chernomazov. I had uh, two questions, actually, if it's okay to do two. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so the first one has to do with the uh, discounts. And I have really mixed feelings about it. So that the, I'm talking about the discounts where like, if you buy $30 worth of, uh, I don't know, bulk, you get five or seven whatever dollars off. I appreciate the idea, but some, somehow I feel that it could be benefiting people who are able to spend more uh, uh, in, in, and it puts people who cannot spend as much at the less favorable situation. And uh, I can definitely see the, how the pros and cons of it, but it's just a concern I wanted to share. And the second question is, is there anything in the co-op's plans uh, to incent, like, I appreciate all the efforts being done to cultivate the food shed of all the local farms that supply uh, to the co-op. Uh, I'm curious if there's any effort to also incentivize a local food shed to use more renewable energy in their uh, daily processes so that our food shed is less dependent on fossil energy, which would effectively make us less, pro less vulnerable to uh, price fluctuation as well as make us less carbon dependent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. That's, that's really an <clears throat> insightful comment. We've been, have we been talking about how our environmental values. We think about you know, environmental, social, financial. Um, we've done a lot in, internally in terms of our equipment, internal operations, to the point where we're starting to think about what's the next step? How can we have more environmental impact? And we've, we've actually been thinking more along the lines of the consumer, because actually if you look at the, the energy profile of food in the country, about a third of it is it comes on the consumer end. Usually we think of, of trucking and distribution as being the biggest user, to, you know, running trucks across the country, but it's actually only around 10%. A third of it is is in the consumer traveling from home to the store, back again, preparing the food, refrigerating the food, and then throwing away a portion of it at the end. All of that is a, is a big chunk, and we can do a lot as a community. Um, but I, I like looking upstream as well. And what is it that um, our producers are doing to reduce their impact, not just certified organic, but there, you know, there are other things. And then sharing that information with consumers so they can favor those businesses. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Other comments? We have about uh, five, six more minutes here. Uh, here we go. I just have a point of information or a request for a uh, point. Um, there is a bylaws um, uh, change proposed. Is there a discussion period after that proposal is in front of the members? Well, we have oh, another yes. opportunity yeah. to discuss that. Indeed. Indeed. That, yeah, we, we, that will be after the Q&A. Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, any other questions or comments about the co-op? There's one. We'll get to you. Say your name. Don't forget. Andrea Stefani, one more time. Would it be maybe a good idea to have an independent um, group from the member, uh, members volunteer group to form a little evaluation committee to evaluate for, uh, to meet with uh, staff and uh, independent from the council members figure out where the stress situations are and what could be done and then make some suggestions afterwards. I was once part of an independent school and that outside evaluation group worked really well to figure out what the stresses were for teachers or for paraeducators and for students and parents, rather than put it all back onto the council members and on the organization of the co-op. Because there's very often an employer, employee kind of situation and it makes it harder to be open and honest because employment is hanging on the line. So that was my suggestion. Okay, good idea. All right. Um, other questions or comments? Uh, down there. I think that's Elizabeth. I'm there was a gentleman, that's all right. Okay. Mention your name. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Jezdio. I've worked at the co op for 17 years and I've been a member since uh, I think 1996 or something like that. I was hoping to get away without saying anything tonight, but um, some people had questions, so I figured I'd just answer it for the group. Um, some of the, I guess there's been some stuff brought up about some of the issues of the staff, and people are kind of wondering, like, what does that mean? Like, what's going on? So 
Um, I will say I worked at the co-op before we had a union and I've worked at the co-op since we've had a union. Um, and I know years ago we used to resolve issues uh, I used to be the chief steward of the union, and we, we would go, we would have a year go by with no grievances filed, no formal grievances filed, because we could sit down with management, the department manager, one-on-one, -on -one, and resolve the issue. Right now we have... One, two, six unresolved grievances right now on the table, and I would say in a year we probably have like 20, 20 grievances being filed a year. Um, we've had to send things to arbitration, which is incredibly costly, both for us and for you all and the co-op. Um, so we're hoping to find ways to um, get things resolved at that step one, or even in a conversation. Um, so we have that. This year, we. We went into contract negotiations, and as most of you know, um, negotiations went on. We signed, I think, four different contract extensions. It went on for, negotiations went on for about five and a half months. It was exhausting um, for everybody involved, and, and um, we have to battle every single year for our health care. Um, we had mentioned at the bargaining table that it would be great if the co-op would join with us, with the union, and in solidarity, um, fight together for single-payer health care so that everybody in this room <laughs> right on yeah um, and and that offer was not taken up on so maybe that's something that you all could talk to the council about would be to you know let's let's work on this together we all need it 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 needs to change um, and recently uh, one of the things that people are a little disgruntled about right now is they turned the staff discount off on a new product item without bargaining with us. We filed a step one grievance, it was denied, now we're into step two. So that's the kind of thing that's kind of going on. And all these things impact different staff in different ways. Um, and thank you all for listening. So thanks. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two more comments, okay. Mention your name. My name is Armand Altman, uh, and when I just heard about the kind of costs that are ensuing with, with, with negotiation and mediation in terms of staff concerns, I'm both a clinical psychologist and a legal mediator, and I'm a member of the co-op, and I just want everyone to know that I, I feel that it's really a critical issue that staff, you can't please 100% of the staff, but that generally staff should be fairly happy and healthy working at the co-op. And I'm willing to offer my services both as a psychologist and legal mediator with no fee. I'm licensed and I just want everyone to know that if there are other issues here, you should not have to be paying any money uh, and that I feel that it is important that the staff be able to have a legitimate, legitimate right to be able to say these are my concerns and that they're heard and that I would again be available. I only live in Morrisville, it takes me a half hour to get here. So I just want that to be known. Thank you. I'm gonna take one more comment. I think we have time, there we go, Tom. Hi, my name is Tom Mulholland. Uh, I look out at everybody and I see the majority of people have white hair, gray hair, or no hair, including myself. And so I want to be sure about something that was mentioned earlier. This, uh, um, oh, thank you. Um, something that was mentioned earlier about the senior citizen discount. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought I heard that the final decision was not going to be made by all the white-haired, gray-haired, balding people, but by a small group of people. Is that true? So that decision has been delegated by the council to the management team. We should not be made up to the people who were here at the very beginning. I mean, I'm not one of them. I've been around quite a while. But doesn't I, that seem, I, in as much as the co-op has an operating profit, 150000 
Why then take away the discount to make the 150,000 then 350,000 or whatever it is? It doesn't make sense. It just, it, I, I, I see your point. It just has to do with the level of decision making. There's, level of decision yeah, right. So, so, so. So the you know the running of a member benefit program is is given to the to the management team to decide what are the you know what are the, the co-op links or the uh, member appreciation days all the various components of the of that are, are the responsibility of the management team to to make so we take that seriously we've looked at the change in time in the number of seniors and the amount of money that's going into the senior discount program for example last year the senior discount the expense of that grew about fifty. 15%. Sales grew about a half a percent. So there's a mismatch there. We're going to need to address it at some point. So we're trying to be proactive and be transparent about it. That's why we structured this co-op conversation. And, and like it or not, that's how we structured the decisions about that program. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, are these comments about discounts? We'll, we'll take a few more because it's on one topic, but we will need to close down the Q&A section soon. So we're going to take comments if they are about discounts. Well, uh, understand, let me, as a preface, point out that there is a, an approach that we have been undertaking for the past year plus to collect information, to have feedback from members about the subject of discounts. So by no means was this annual meeting the one and only chance. We're happy to hear from you on this subject now, but there are some other avenues that you can pursue to let us know how you feel about discounts. So with that, again, here we go. Um, this is Irvin. Um, I went to some of the meetings regarding the senior discount stuff, and I just wanted to express, while I have been critical of some management processes at the co-op in the past, um, going to these meetings, being a minority, being under 60 um, at the meeting, um, most of the people who were over 60, after looking at the numbers and having an actual discussion about it, seemed, in my opinion, to actually be for these changes and suggesting it. So. I really do think that the members are being heard, those who are actually going through the process and having their voices heard. Good. Thank you. We got a comment over there. Oh, we're just going to zigzag a little bit. Yes. My name is Brenda Thau. Regarding the senior, citizens, the senior discount, all around this country, we seniors have worked and given of our lives. We've worked for our benefits. This isn't the only thing that's being taken away from us. If you feel that you are being taken advantage of by losing any kind of benefits, there is an organization out there to help you, and it's called protectseniors.org. And I really encourage you to look at their website and see what they're doing to protect us. Thank you. Thanks. And we have a comment right here. Again, we're going to stay on discounts for a little bit longer. Hi, my name is uh, David Bergamini, and I was, I've been in several of those, uh, those fo focus groups on the senior discount. And my experience is just the opposite of the gentleman here, uh, whereas most of the white-haired and gray-haired people at these uh, focus groups were not in favor. And, and, and also were um, really receptive to the idea of opening up the vote on this issue and taking it away from management and making it a plebiscite, making it open to a vote of all the members. Uh, the fact that all the members are seniors, or most of the members are seniors, may sway that vote, but still, it's, it's really such an important issue that I think it should be voted on by the membership at large rather than just the management group. Putting it to the management group is, in my mind, just a way of, of, of centralizing the power, and it's obvious where the management group feels on this, how the management group feels on this. I mean, having been to the focus groups, which were guided by Kerry Yu and your uh, management consultants, I, I really think that it needs to be opened up to the membership to vote on. I think it's important. And okay, it really improve, improve your uh, relationship with the management as, as a whole. You want to come in? Thank you very much. Uh, we'll do just one more down there. Hi, uh, my name is Jane Oskathar, and I'd just like to I'm really quite curious about the 
statistics that you gave us where seniors are getting discounts of about 15% or something like that, that means we're buying things at the co-op. We are one of your best customers. So why are you going to penalize us? The other thing is, and I agree with the person, the person who was saying about seniors have worked a long time and given a lot to their communities, and this is a way for a community, regardless of what particular portion of the community, can recognize that effort. We are, seniors are, uh, getting ripped off, is the best way I could talk about it, nationally with the cuts to various critical programs to seniors, and I really hate to see us follow that same pattern. Thank you very much. I want to assure everybody here that we are going to try to make uh, as many mechanisms possible to comment on the discount system. Um, we have been doing conversations and obta obtaining feedback. Um, there's going to be another phase to this. I don't know what form it will take. Um, I, I want to say I think what you're saying is being heard, and we, we, you can't have an instant answer from, uh, from everybody today, but this is being heard, and please be on the lookout for other information about how you can participate in discussing this further. Uh, there's been a comment about whether even the decision-making apparatus about how we, we, we uh, tackle this uh, should be reviewed. Uh, I, I don't know, but we have heard you. We have definitely heard that request. Um, so thanks very much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now change us over to the next stage of our agenda. What we're going to look at now are two proposals for changes to the bylaws. And I guess we have a slide that will come up here. Um, the first proposal, and I hope you all saw this in your uh, annual meeting um, Baylor. Um, the first proposal is to change the word member to owner throughout the bylaws. And the motivation for doing this is that we think that the term owner better represents how, what your involvement with the co-op is. Uh, you can be a member of a health club, but at the co-op, you are an owner. You participate in governance as you're doing right now, you participate in the profits of the co-op, and you really should walk into that store thinking that you own it. So we thought the better term was owner. And so I'm going to turn this over for discussion on this topic. I will entertain a motion to make the change in the bylaws, but we can have discussion in any order that you would like. Yes. We have our mic runners coming around. My name is Rick Barstow, and I see this as not an either or. I think we are both members and owners. I would like to see member slash owner or something like that. Okay, other comments? Yeah, uh, there's someone, yes, there we go. I'm Nancy Sherman, and I wanna know um, how much you have to have paid in your dues to be an owner, and what if you're not up to date in your dues, and I don't know if that's possible, but um, who, Actually, what's the definition? There, there, of there, is, a, there is a definition. Um, you have to be current. But that means that if you're paying annually, you have to have made that year's payment by the due date that particular year. There is such a thing as being in arrears, and if that is true, you are classified as not being a member in good standing. So that's the answer to your question. Oh, oh, even this part? Okay, yes. okay, good. Uh, Michael, let me introduce you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do this incorrectly. I just thought we'd have a discussion on this. This is Michael Levine. Uh, yes, I will introduce myself. Um, but before I do that, I want to say not only do I appreciate the whole staff, but tonight I have not yet heard applause for the fabulous dinner that the deli and kitchen staff put out.
And since I know you're all here for the food, it's actually amazing that you're still here. <laughs> So my name is Michael Levine, and as many of you may know, I've uh, done a lot of work with the co-op as a consultant through the years on member engagement and member outreach on topics that are covered in the co-op conversations. But tonight, I am here actually as a member and a volunteer helping to facilitate this particular session. And I have really had nothing to do with any of the bylaw discussions that have preceded this being on the ballot or anything else. I just kind of caught up to speed yesterday when I was asked to facilitate this. And since I am not a expert in Robert's Rules or Parliamentary Procedure, Michael Duane is our resident parliamentarian for any process questions that may come up during the discussion. Uh, so my goal here is to assure varying viewpoints get shared, and the goal is to help member owners figure out where you stand on these two proposals. There's about 20 minutes total allocated for the two proposals. Alex outlined the first one, but we also have one um, the, proposal number two on the ballot, which we will talk about in a minute. So, and each discussion will be followed by a vote. So we're gonna take up proposal one first, and a couple of ground rules, logistics, and then we'll open it up. And I do wanna note that um, we're probably running about 20 minutes late on the agenda. Is that about right? 12, 12. Okay, so um, we, will, we will be mindful of the time. So, ground rules. Uh, welcome to make comments in support or against the proposed changes. There's a lot of people here, obviously, so please be concise. Keep your time to a minute or less to give others a chance. You're welcome to ask questions if you would like something clarified about either proposal when it's being discussed, and the council president will do her best to answer these or uh, hand the question off to whoever on the council or staff she thinks is most appropriate. Uh, listen carefully and try not to repeat what someone else has already said. Keep the side conversations to uh, a mute, and keep an open mind and be respectful of all opinions. Along with that, keep in mind that I believe everybody in this room wants the, what's best for the co-op, and opinions may vary about what they might be, but we all have that same end goal. Uh, logistics, I thought we would have some microphone stands, which we don't have, but I am gonna ask the two microphone runners to just stand in the middle on each side, and um, people can come up to the microphone so we're not running all around the room. But I also know that for some people it's either uncomfortable or difficult to get up. So after we have some central questions, uh, we will then do some running around and then come back to the, the central aisles. So they'll be right here in the middle. Um, and as I said, Robert's rules are going to be the operating sense of the day. So, should I repeat the question that Alex has already put on the floor, or are we okay with that? Okay, we haven't had the motion yet? Okay, so, um, some would argue that the motion is already on there by being warned, but we will take a motion on proposal one regarding the bylaw change. I think somebody has to state it, right? Or do I? Okay, so moved. Yes, your name? Randy Cook? Coke, Randy Coke. Okay, so, in a second, thank you. I told you I wasn't a moderator. Second, your name? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so any discussion on proposal one, and as I said, please go to the microphones. Hi, I'm Sue Morris, and I wanna speak against the first proposal of the change from member to owner. For me, the word owner smacks of corporatization, which is something I'd like to discourage in the co-op and work more toward collaborative actions. And to me, member says collaboration better than owner. Thank you. A 
I just have a question, Michael Sherman. I have a question. Owners sometimes incur liabilities. So I want to know if ownership means that we, as a collective group, now have some different liabilities or different responsibilities from being members. Uh, first off, can we get your name? Oh, oh I'm sorry, oh, I apologize. Um, this is a terminology change that would not have legal repercussions. Your ownership is mostly uh, a stake that is your property uh, in, in the co-op, um, and that would not change. Where The reason for looking at owners is that it is a term that a lot of co-ops have started to use to help recognize the involvement people have. But we're, as we're hearing today, maybe that type of involvement doesn't feel positive, but it isn't a liability issue. Want to want to be a little more specific about that, so the change in terminology doesn't change the way the bylaws are structured. The members still own the assets and um, and the equity, and they still own the liability. Um, in in practically speaking, if the co-op were to go under, basically the your equity investment would be the last thing to be repaid. So, so you just have to recognize that. Um, if the co-op were mismanaged and ran, ran up debts in excess of its assets that couldn't be um, covered, then we as an ownership group would, would be responsible for that. And, and the change in terminology doesn't change that. Name, please. Um, uh, Avram Pat from Worcester. Uh, I've been involved in many different kinds of cooperatives uh, basically since I was born. I was born in the nation's oldest housing cooperative. I've been a manager of a co-op and I've been on boards of co-ops. In answer to the, the question about liability, by Vermont statute, uh, the members co-op statute, the members of a cooperative are not individually liable. Um, for the actions of, of a co-op, just as the um, shareholders of a, of a um, shareholder-owned corporation are not individually liable uh, for what that corporation does. They can lose the value of their investment, and as Kari said, if something terrible would happen to this co-op, then, then we, we all lose, but no one is individually liable, regardless of whether you're called a member um, or an owner. But I would like to speak in support of this bylaw change. Um, it is, for me, incredibly important with what is happening in this country now uh, and in the world in terms of the control of uh, the economy, the consolidation of the economy, for people to understand that in a cooperative, the members own the cooperative, whether it's a consumer co-op like Hunger Mountain Co-op, or a farmer co-op, or a worker-owned co-op, the, the, the people who are using the services and goods of that co-op are the owners, um, and they benefit as the owners of the co-op. And I think that's, that is important for members of a co-op, to understand it's important for everyone who is not a member of the co-op when they look at the organization to understand it's not just a membership organization uh, like you join an organization because you support the work they do and you pay your dues. This is a business um, and it, it uh, provides goods and services to its members who are the owners. And so I think this is uh, the right time uh, to, make, to make this change. It's an important statement to make. Thank you. Do we have one more comment or? I was just asked, I, I, to, just for, for people who don't know, I was general manager of Washington Electric Co-op for 16 and a half years. Um, uh, and between uh, the two members of uh, my household, we have six separate co-op memberships. All right, is there anybody who is seated and didn't want to come up front that has a germane comment for this question? I have to disagree. I'm a member of six or seven co-ops. 
insurance, Washington Electric, um, different things. And to me, member talks about community. And I think about our notices that go out about the different programs at the co-op that say um, free to members, are we gonna say free to owners? I just think if we really feel there needs to be a change to philosophically make it clear that we're owners, then it should be member owners. Because owners, to me, just sounds unconnected. It doesn't sound like community to me. All right. Um, I, th I think we've heard pretty clearly on both sides of this. It's not a, it's not a very complex issue. So are we ready for a vote? Hmm? Oh. Thank you. Fred Collins from uh, Duxbury. Um, yeah, to me, a, a rose by any other name is still a rose. I'm not terribly concerned about the terminology, except that I wonder the, the co-op has X number of thousand dollars of assets. And if I choose not to be an owner anymore and I leave, am I entitled to my percentage of those assets? You're, you're entitled to the equity investment that you made in the co-op, which would have been 150 to $180. Yeah, you're, you're entitled to the investment that you put into the co-op. If you're asking, does your investment appreciate, the answer to that is no. But that has nothing to do with whether you're a member or an owner. <laughs> All right, are there other questions? Otherwise, I feel like we're, we, because of time, we really should call a question. Um, I, I don't mean to be speaking this often, but it just seems I'm being a bit zen and rational. But there is a difference between the word member and owner. I mean, clearly, if we're going to look at this ideologically, and it just seems that we are all owners. Now, we can go member slash owner, and then when you have to be typing this up, you've got member slash owner. But if we want to just look at this, I feel, and I'm speaking for myself, that it seems reasonable that I'm an owner not a member. Now, if someone says it means the same thing, I'll say, okay, but if we're talking about having a vote, then I would, n I would vote for being an owner as many co-ops throughout the country. People are owners. And even here in Morrisville, where we've just started a co-op, we're talking about being owners. You can, some people might think they're a member. So I just would recommend that owner be the choice. Okay, so does somebody want to call the question? All right, and your name? Did you get that? Could you say that again? Okay, and a second for calling the question? Oh, we, this woman called the question, and I'm wondering if there's a second on that. There is right there. Okay, so the question is called, my parliamentarian, could you tell us what to do next? Okay, so those in favor of calling the question say aye. aye. Those in favor of not calling the question say nay. nay. I think that's pretty clear. Yeah, I think. Yes. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Renee Carpenter. So I heard several people talk about uh, preferring the term member owner, that if there has to be a change. So this is, I'm asking a question about a point of order. And if I can ask the question, then you can tell me. The question is, since this has been brought up several times, what's the protocol to make an amendment that if we're changing the bylaw, we could take a vote on member owner. That's my question. What's the protocol? The question's been called. The question's been called. That it's not debatable. If you wanted to make an amendment, you should have brought that up before the question was called. So the question now goes to the 
Sorry, um, since Robert's rules is being followed um, and the question's been called and two-thirds have agreed to that, that ends the debate and we go to the question. If someone wanted to amend, that should have been done earlier in the process. So we are... And, and I don't disagree with John Braban. I don't disagree with Michael's asset, assertion about making changes. But a point of order, a clarification on procedure is not that. And what Renee Carpenter was asking for was a clarification on procedure. So we vote on this, and if you vote for it, it's done. If you vote it down, then there'll be another opportunity to propose an amendment um, which would allow for uh, maybe a different language change. That's, okay, that's what Renee was looking for. Okay, thank you. I'm glad that there are sharper minds than mine on Robert's rules. All right, so we are now um, going to have a vote on the question. And you have a green card. Actually, we could start with a, a voice vote, I guess. And if it seems close, then we can go to the cards. Um, so those who are in favor of making this proposed change Proposal number one on the bylaws. Please say aye. Aye. And those who are opposed to this proposal, number one, please say nay. Nay. All right, let's go to cards, because I think that's, you know, whether it's volume or numbers, it's hard to tell. So are we just holding up cards and then they'll be counted? And this. Uh, Kari, what is, yeah, what's the required, uh, what's the required number? Simple majority on this question, and please hold up your cards until everything is counted. Yeah, okay, uh, Steve Farnham had a good suggestion. Put down the orange ones. It'll be much easier to count if we just count the green ones, and then we'll count the orange ones. And we are counting on you only to be voting one way or the other. Uh, so we should clear that up. We're just checking to make sure which simple majority. Okay. It is a simple majority. We just double check the rules. And our, our counters, do they have a, a number yet? Everybody's hands are getting tired. <laughs> Where are the counters? Can you wave your hand if you're a counter? <laughs> Sorry, this is the workout part of the session. When you have a number, let me know, but don't tell me what the number is. Just let me know you have one. This was a lot easier when only 10 people showed up at our meetings. <laughs> Okay, do you, do, you ha do you have a number? Don't tell me what it is, just let me know if you have one. Yes? Okay, green cards down, orange cards up, please. Uh, I would 
was told that I was doing this case. That sounds like I didn't like the answer to my question. If I'm an owner, I leave. I'm entitled to one six thousandth of the value of the sale. No. Well, no, she said yes. She's a In some places, they just pull out their cell phones and do this. Not yet. They're still conferring to make sure they have the same number. So 93? Yeah. And um, can you tell us what the numbers were? It was uh, 93 against 82 for. Okay, so that fails. And parliamentarian, do, do I just move on to the next question now? So uh, you announced that that motion, um, it failed. So the answer was no. So before the gavel drops, uh, it's appropriate if anyone want, makes a, wants to make an emotion, wants to make a motion with regard to question one. So if anyone wanted to make a motion with regard to question one, now's the time to do it. But once the gavel drops, then you move to question two. So here's an opportunity to make an amendment to question one. John. Hot mic. Wow. Uh, I'd like to make an amendment or propose a new motion uh, to change the term to member dash owner. And I'm looking for a second. John Brabant. Dash, member dash owner. Renee Carpenter seconds that. Joe McKeon, I would second the motion. Okay, so we've been seconded. So, um, yes, but let me just point out that this vote, um, which we will have discussion if that's wanted or move to call the question, but this will need to vote by 90% of the people in the room in order to be adopted. That's the, the co-op rule on making amendments or, I don't know if there's an amendment or a new proposal, but whatever from the floor. An amendment to what's been warned requires a 90% approval. So just realize that that will be the threshold. Uh, could you wait for the microphone, please? Thank Point you. of order, I think this is not an amendment, it is a new motion. And so if it's a new motion, it should only be adopted by the rules of passing a motion. Is a new motion allowed? No, that's what I thought. A new motion is not allowed on the floor of a co-op meeting, only an amendment, because it's not a warned item. So those who aren't here uh, didn't have the advantage of knowing that it might be coming up for a vote. So that said, John, do you want to withdraw your suggestion? Okay, thank you. All right, so we're gonna move on from that Proposal number one is voted down, and we're gonna move on to number two. And number two, <sighs> okay, proposal number two on this sheet, which everybody received in the mail with their ballot. Hmm? Not yet. Um, this is about updating the presentation of the member voting article in the bylaws. And uh, do I have a 
motion to, what is it? Uh, how do we start discussion? You move the motion, thank you. Stephen Klein, and a second? Okay. Yeah, so I, I, so the, well, there is no motion, really, right? It's a proposal. It's a proposal. And the, the explanation of the proposal, well, the proposal that I'm looking at, and I'm gonna turn this over to Alex, actually, to explain and read the proposal, because she's more familiar with it. Okay, this is a proposal to take the narrative section of the bylaws concerning voting requirements and present that information formatted as a table. The council made this effort to convert that information, which is currently very difficult to read, into the form of a table. Uh, making one substantive change that I'd like to mention. The one change that we'll be making is to drop a sentence that concerns voting by mailed ballots. It's a method of voting we don't currently use. The bylaw does not treat any other ma mechanical, uh, effort, uh, mechanical aspects of voting. And generally speaking, the terms of voting are set in the bylaws by the council. So the need for something about an outmoded method of voting seems uh, to be out of place. So that is the substantive change. The effort of council was to convert the existing bylaw into a table for clarity and ease of understanding. We wanted to be very certain that we accomplished that attention. So we put this to four tests. I want to tell you what they are. The first, it just involved council itself discussing this and, and uh, examining all the ramifications. Probably the people in this room who know a lot about this bylaw are sitting here in front of you at the council. We also formed a bylaw committee that worked at a highly nuanced level to evaluate the very, very meticulous components of this and study all the implications of the language. We went back and forth, push and pull, to make sure that we could actually record every item that exists in that really rather nastily written bylaw. We also studied history, that is, the history of amendments that in fact caused the bylaw to be so difficult, so, so oddly structured. It fails to have parallel and structure that you would anticipate. So we studied the origin of the elements in the bylaw. And finally, we asked, we consulted an attorney and asked the attorney to provide an interpretation of the existing bylaw and a review and verification that every conversion that we made from the narrative in that bylaw into the tabular format was in fact identical, and the lawyer said it was. Now we have a fifth test, which is a discussion with you today. So we're bringing this in front of you, and we've done it by putting the bylaw, the before and the after in front of you. To be honest, it's very hard to read that existing bylaw. It, it, it just, it is tough. That's all I can tell you. The, if you have questions about where something is from the old bylaw to the new, we will do our very best to answer it um, because we do know where everything is located, but that is, the, that is the concept. The motivation to do this was exclusively to make the bylaw for voting requirements clear to everyone. Just this minute when we were discussing majorities, we here consulted this table because it was a faster method for figuring out what the majority necessary to amend the bylaws was. You saw it used today. It's been used by the council for a while. So that's our whole motivation. Um, very quickly, we're gonna vote on this and nothing is at stake. If you vote no, the bylaws will not change. If you vote yes, the bylaws will not change except that all of you will be able to read them better. That's it. That's all. Um, could you just sit down for one minute, please? Um, that was um, the 
Council's opinion or your opinion? I'm just trying to be clear. Council's opinion, okay, thank you. And now we'll hear what the members, member owners have to say. Now, do you have a point of order? Wait for the microphone, Stephanie, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephanie Kaplan. I heard Alex just say that everything that was in the text of the existing bylaws was moved over to the table. Um, but in fact, there are two things that are in the existing bylaw that, are, that were not moved to the table. And I think that's a point of order. Um, that's why I raised it as a point of order. Well, that, do, you, do you just want to ask? Say what they are and ask Alex okay, well, if she can point um, out. The way I read the existing bylaw, um, and it is complicated, I agree with that. It's difficult to wrap your mind around this or to focus on it, but I have spent the time. And um, in that, okay, we're on page, with all the strikeouts, we're on the strikeout page, okay? And we're down at the last paragraph. And in the middle of that last paragraph, it says, with respect to motions to be voted on at an annual or a special meeting of the members of the cooperative in order that a motion carries, the quorum requirement must be met and the members in good standing must vote in the affirmative as follows. And there's A, B, okay? Those were moved to the table. Uh, D and E were moved to the table. But C was not moved to the table as a topic that is voted on at an annual or special meeting, which is what the bylaws say, the existing bylaws say, that was stricken. Okay, can I just ask Alex if she can explain, uh, yeah, if she can explain that point. This is an example, and I hope this doesn't get too boring. This is an example of how the um, bylaw structure has some failed parallel components. The first major paragraph block of the bylaw concerns who can vote and the mechanics of voting, voting at a meeting or voting by mailed ballot. The second general paragraph concerns what the majorities are uh, to pass a motion. Now, the second paragraph doesn't repeat the identical topic, or it doesn't repeat the topics in the identical way. The one that you are citing is to exchange pledge mortgage or, uh, or all, all or substantially all of the assets in the cooperative, and that we have listed using the language that appeared in the first paragraph, which is to exchange pledge mortgage or sell all or substantially all of the assets of, the, oh, actually it is the one, that one is identical. So it, it is in place, it is there. You, I think there's one place where it says materially and another place it says substantially. I do acknowledge that that terminology we consolidated because the two, uh, the two intentions were clear, but they use slightly different language. Point of Alex, I, 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 let me just clarify this point. Yeah. I, I don't think you understood her question. Okay. So I believe what Stephanie was saying is that there are places in the current bylaws that refer, and this is particularly to the question about debt and the question about enlarging the building. Am uh, I it's correct? It's not just debt, it's selling the assets of the co-op. Yeah. yeah. But that clause, yes. and, and the clause about in expansion exactly. of the co-op. Exactly. Those are listed in the current bylaws in two different places. One is about a vote, and one is about a meeting. She's saying that the table only refers to votes and not a meeting. So that's what she's looking for. So let me comment on that. I'm, I'm sorry that I did misunderstand you. I think that the place that then we're going to discuss is the fact that this list of five elements where we, where we describe what the majorities are necessary to pass uh, is, is captioned, it's headed by something that says, with respect to, vo to motions to be voted on at an annual or special meeting. And uh, I understand why you would interpret that as meaning that everything that is in that list is voted at a meeting. I understand that. The prior paragraph is very explicit, though, explaining that uh, voting to elect members of council on proposals to, to sell and or expand is to be done by mailed ballot. That notion is not invalidated by the phrase that begins that section. In fact, we can say that for two reasons, and let me point out what they are. 
The first is that the, bylaw, um, the bylaws were amended in 2003 to make this change to move uh, the decisions on expansion or sale of the co-op to a vote conducted by all member owners <laughs> by a mailed ballot. When the bylaws were physically amended, there was an error made and the, the notion of listing everything, uh, listing all the majorities was left in one place and we lost sight of the fact that this header said, with respect to things that are voted at a meeting. That phrase does not negate the, the change to the bylaws that states that voting will be done by mailed ballot on those two topics and on the topic of electing council members. It's a pretty unambiguous thing, but I do seriously understand why that header does confuse. But the only good interpretation that we can come up with is that the intention is to follow what exists in the first paragraph. So I think that kind of identifies the crux of the difference of opinion. I mean, this is how the council has gone through and interpreted it. And I think what you're raising and probably other people will want to speak to is perhaps not agreeing with that interpretation. Uh, that's true, Michael, with that respect. And I will speak to it later, I hope. There's another, however, there's another one. And that Alex said that everything that's in the table, in, excuse me, in the pros, existing bylaws has been moved to the table. The other thing that wasn't moved, um, and it's, it's in connection with this annual meeting, it says for those two issues, the issues of selling the assets or expanding the co-op, if you look at the um, column in your table, uh, voting period, under those, it says now to be term determined by council. If it were, as I interpret it myself, also being a lawyer and also able to read, um, that the there was supposed to be a vote at a, at a meeting, you've lost, there's no notice requirement anymore. There's no 14-day notice requirement. So the notice requirement now is determined by the council. And I think that is another point of order. The reason I'm bringing it up now is that that, in fact, wasn't moved over. That, in fact, according to this, there's no 14-day notice period for voting on either to sell the assets or to expand the co-op. And that's why I bring it up as a point of order and not just a disagreement with interpretation. This is a good point. The reason, and we talked about this a good deal, the reason it says to be determined by council, I happened to allude to it earlier, the bylaws in general provide that the council does determine the mechanics of elections. For example, how long polls are open, when things are warned, what type of informational meetings we would use, uh, a long list of techniques we might use for feedback. Council will determine those things. In the absence in the bylaws, particularly when you read paragraph one, there is no notice there, there is no, descri no description in the bylaws of what the notice period must be. So we default to something else that exists in the bylaws, and that's what this table provides for now. It will be determined by council. We actually considered, by the way, trying to come up with a, a warning and a notice and all those terms, but we realized we actually stopped ourselves there because we said that would be a substantive change. The bylaws as they are written don't provide for that because the paragraph one that describes voting by mail ballot doesn't list the amount of time that you vote, etc. It doesn't list any requirements and it was inappropriate for us to try to guess what they should be since our goal was simply to make this table and carry the old bylaw. But it's a good example of what the table needs, and I hope somebody does fill in that square. It's just that we couldn't do so since the existing bylaws do not cover that. Yes. I'd like to go back Microphone, to Microphone, please. I'm sorry, yeah. Identify uh, yourself. Billy, Billy Donovan from Washington. Um, Alex, I, I wanted to go back to Stephanie's point where your job is to convey all the material from the narrative form to the table form. And the uh, 
uh, line C that has those two voting topics in it has a relationship of voting to both uh, mailed ballots and to uh, uh, voting at meetings. And you haven't accomplished your goal of transferring all that material because what, it, what appears on the table uh, vertically from and voter participation to those two items is only included with all members by paper or electronic ballot. You did not include the other topic which is in the narrative form, which is its relationship to voting in a meeting such as this. So you have not accomplished your job as you said you meant to do. Okay. So and, it, and it wasn't, yeah. For the, I, I, believe, I believe Alex tried to explain the council's interpretation of that. It's different, it's different than what you just said, but, but it was not a, an omission yes. by accident. May, may this I, is may where I, the interpretation may I just quickly, in. yes. So if I, if I got Alex's uh, uh, response originally to that was, what she was saying was is that because it, it appears in, in that uh, narrative paragraph first as a mail belt, and that is some kind of priority over the special meeting portion of it, and so that's how they transferred it to the, to the table? I, I believe that was That's what she's the, saying, isn't the essence it? Of it? Okay. I, I have a point of order. And, and she referred to the history of the bylaw. But, but the, the point is not really how it came to be. I think Alex has made the council position clear that this is their interpretation. And now I think it's time to hear from the members whether they agree with that. May or I just not, ask? May I ask? Alice spoke about a vote in 2003 and that there was some kind of interpretation about what that vote was. May I, may I ask what it is that you go back 14 years and, and feel like you have the power to determine what was done 14 years ago for a vote? And then you want to apply that to how you want to interpret it now? Okay, I, I would like you to just everybody just tone down your voice it's fine to ask questions but you're sounding a little accusatory do you want to give a very brief answer to that because this bylaw had amendments that had what appeared to be potential contradictions that's exactly what you've looked at we looked at the source of that first paragraph and the source of it is a bylaw amendment from 2003 that was unambiguous about calling for votes held by all members by ballot on those topics and the election of council. That was inserted in the bylaw without perhaps the tidiest way, but that's why we did look back 14 years. We would have looked back 25 years. It doesn't matter the time period. We just had to figure out well, what, what, which, which is more true? And that's what we did. Okay, so let's go to the middle microphones and I see somebody standing right there. Your name? Michael Billingsley. Um, I was a member in, um, for quite a few years as well as one of the, like Avram Pat, one of the founders of the Source Co-op uh, over in Plainfield. And I would like to ask a question and I'm gonna try and say this very carefully. But in the context of how it's presented to us, that this is a simplification with no ramifications that changes nothing about the spirit of the original bylaws, I'm reminded as a former draft counselor, this, the uh, placard up at the postcard office that says, it's quick, it's easy, it's the law, allowing people to sign up instantly um, without a great deal of forethought for the selective service, but which in fact, completely abrogates their access to information about deferments, about legitimate handicaps, and all the other kind of things that would stop a person from necessarily being eligible for the draft. In this instance, the simplification also, in, at least as I see it, may be an obfuscation or a, and, and in a sense, a complicate, complicating of something. Because when I see, for instance, to change the bylaws, a majority of members voting, and then it interprets that on the back, as meeting together in a meeting. And then I see changing the Articles of Association, the members voting, and it's interpreted on the back to be meeting in an annual meeting or a specially called meeting. And then I look at to exchange pledge or mortgage our assets, it's interpreted on the back as being all members by paper and electronic ballot. I cannot see why there would not be an equally important stress in such an important matter upon members attending an annual meeting or specially called meeting by floor vote. Similarly, dissolving the cooperative, 
two-thirds of the members voting, and in the back it's electronic ballot. And in a sense, what it does, it gives management, if I, inter if I interpret this correctly, it gives management the option of whether or not to hold a meeting. In other words, it says, all members by ballot or electronic ballot, there's a meeting mentioned. So I assume it's interpreting the wording of the struck out paragraphs, which I don't find that hard to understand. It's interpreting that as meaning we don't meet. We don't meet to talk about exchanging, pledging, or mortgaging. We don't meet to talk about expanding the co-op. There's no need for it because our new bylaws would not say meet. Am I not correct in this? Okay. Do we have somebody over here? I'm a bit confused. Uh, from the very beginning, the presentation from the board, when I heard there was a comment saying there was one substantial change. At the end of the presentation, I heard there were no changes. There's a contradiction there that I don't understand. Further, the proposal talks about uh, changing the formatting. And if we're just changing the formatting, fine. But if we're changing the content, I want to know exactly what it is. And if there were potential contradictions, I think it would be appropriate for those potential contradictions to be explained carefully. And we vote on those contradictions separately from the formatting. But I must say, what the board presented created confusion in my mind, saying there are no changes. And there are substantial changes, or at least one. And I need clarification for that. I don't know what the proper process is, point of order or amendment or whatever, but I think we should vote on the formatting differently from the content and separate those two out. That was my suggestion. However, it is done in parliamentarial methods. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Eric Bachman. Thank you. Um, Michael, do you have any parliamentary enlightenment on that one? It sounded like a question. Um, I didn't sound, I didn't hear it being a motion, so if there's an no, answer. No, I, th I think he's asking how that might happen to vote from the format separately from the content presented. Uh, well, uh, Stephen, I, I, as, I, as I listened to it, it sounded to me like it was a motion to amend the warned uh, Article 2. Okay. I'm trying to make this in a way that isn't really amending the motion. What we're doing here is we're saying dividing the question. Question one is can we approve the idea of moving to a grid format? And question two is, can we vote on the content of the grid format? So what would we be approving is to sort of make the step, I think, and you can correct me if this is not what you're saying, but to try to, that we, we applaud the idea of moving to a grid approach, which the council is doing, but I think what I'm hearing is sort of a substantial concern about the content of the grid. Is it possible to divide it that way, or is that a different motion? I, I'm going to inquire of uh, Matt Levin, who used to be on the board, who was involved when the not, he left. Okay. The reason I was doing that was because the co-op bylaws, as written right now, say that in order to amend an article, you need a 90% vote of the gathered crowd. Now, you're, you're trying to divide the question into two parts that w wasn't warned that way. I think this gets into the discretion of the facilitator to see whether or not it is the sense of the meeting to divide question one without amending it, unless you have 90%, to go forward um, and, and divide it being question 1A, does the co-op members gathered like the uh, table format and then question 1B. I think that's up to the moderator. Okay, so that's me, and he, microphone. Uh, after hearing that, I'd like to clarify what I uh, want to see. Uh, I think the um, potential contradictions were not adequately defined and clarified for our discussion and our vote. 
I heard a contradiction in the report from the board. So I guess my vote, my, what I like to say is, I think we should vote this down until we have that information, until we have that clarity, uh, so that we can then decide on something that we have in front of us, okay. and not something that's incomplete. Thank you. I, I was actually going to suggest that the format is not really the question. I think we can still wrestle with the question, and I'm sure that if they come up with a better format at some point, everybody will be happy. That's not the question. Okay, so microphones are in the middle. Does anybody want to go and speak? Is uh, Michael Duane? Michael Duane. Uh, is, is that uh, table the motion? Does that take precedence? Let me check my Vermont moderator's handbook that I have right now. Michael is the town moderator in East Montpelier. But we're six months off the town meeting cycle, so he's not quite up to snuff. There's, there, is a, there is a specific provision about tabling and I will get, I'll find it right here, and I think it's on page 20. Hang on. Is it about people yelling out tabling? Would someone recognize? Have the microphone while you discuss this. Thank you. No, you weren't recognized. You just said you wanted to table. I recognize him too. He's kind of a nice guy. We could have a comment while we're researching. Is there anybody standing on a microphone that has something that they'd like to say? Uh, I, I really don't think that you can just have someone yell out, I move to table, when, people, when it's been set up to come to the microphone. And I doubt whether that's addressed in the bylaw. So I'm just gonna say one thing, Peter Kalman. Um, imagine, I'm thinking that I'm a Martian. And I, uh, I, I arrived on Earth, and I've been listening to what's going on here. I think this is the third I issue that's been discussed where we have a serious failure to communicate among us, among all of us, among members, member owners, board members, staff members. And I think that we really need to figure out a way that we can break through some of these communication difficulties Ask ourselves, why? Why are we having these difficulties? I think the staff started to give us some clues about that. We need to listen to each other. We need to look into each other's faces. We need to really believe, as the moderator suggested, that we all are for the same thing. I'm kind of sort of wondering whether that's true. Hi, now I'm Stephanie Kaplan again, and um, I just wanted to say by way of introducing myself that I've been a member of this club since 1984, and my number is 46. And if anybody has a lower number, I want to see your hand up. <laughs> um, so, and I was on the council, somebody? Oh, excellent. 34. <laughs> We've uh, survived all these years. Um, and so you heard a little bit of what I had to say, and I just want to kind of clarify Speak what, closer to the microphone. what my position is on this, having, having really spent a lot of time reading this. And I know the council did, I know their lawyer did, um, but as I said, I'm also an attorney, and I also can read, as you all can read. You don't have to be an attorney to read this and figure it out. Um, although it is complicated. And I guess my bottom line is that if it's, it is confusing because it says there are three ways right now in the bylaws of voting in order to sell the assets of the co-op or to expand the co-op. There are three ways. There are the two ways that Alex was talking about that says it, it, says it right there by mail or by electronic voting, but then it also says that it's also at an, at an annual or a special meeting. 
So I, I'm conceding this is, this is confusing. It may not be contradictory, but it can be confusing to read it. And it is difficult, to, it's very dense to read it. So um, I also wanted to point out that um, I think to, whatever happened in 2003, I, I happened to have been at that meeting, but I think it's irrelevant to what we are trying to look at today. Um, because 2015, right here, there was a meeting, and there was the same proposal with another one, and it was also um, the same thing. It was to get rid of the annual, to, to be able to vote at an annual meeting and just have it through electronic and paper ballot. And the members soundly, by a big majority, voted that down. People made it very clear that they want to continue having debate, discussion, and votes before voting. The debate and the discussion comes before the voting so everybody who's interested can hear the different issues and the different sides of it. And this is an exact, excellent example of what's going on tonight. So what I wanted to do was just stick my neck out because you need 90% to approve an amendment. But I wanted to make move for an amendment to the existing motion. and. In order to understand the amendment, it's really not very complicated, because you have the table that the council prepared. And if you go, you have to look at this, or I can try to explain it. If you go down on this table, if you look in the first column under topic and countdown five and countdown six, and those are the two issues in, in controversy right now. The first one is to exchange, pledge, mortgage, or sell all or substantially all the assets of the cooperative. And the second is to materially expand the cooperative's building structure. And I think it was, as Michael Billingsley pointed out, if you go over to two more columns to voter participation, and you see under these two, it's all members by paper or electronic ballot. But if you go to four, to three, to two, to one, all four above it, it is members attending an annual meeting or especially called meeting by floor vote. So my amendment would propose that all of the council strikeouts on the previous page would stay. They are, I'm not trying to amend those. But that I would strike the under five and six, these two issues, I would strike all members by paper or electronic ballot and the next one I would also strike to be determined by council. And that's, do you understand, that's for both the exchanging, pledging, mortgaging, or selling all the assets of the co-op and then also to materially expand it. So it would just substitute the same process, the same voter participation, the same voting period as already is provided in here for topics one, two, three, and four, and that is it would be members attending an annual meeting or a specially called meeting by floor vote, and the voting period would be at the annual meeting or a specially called meeting. And that is what I am moving to amend the proposal that's on the floor. Do I have a second? Uh, second, Renee Carpenter. I can't, I, I couldn't even hear you, Alex. All right, I, I'm hearing six different things. If you would like to say something, don't just stand up. Be recognized and get a microphone so everybody can hear you. Thank I, you. I did raise my hand before. I want to point out that moderators oftentimes allow people to hijack conversation and discussion by yelling out, call the question. The moderator does not have to recognize someone who shouts that out, and they can continue to allow people to debate. Unless the person is recognized, the call the question is just somebody shouting out, and I think it's very anti-democratic. There's a great deal of discussion going on here, and um, I think it should continue. As to the substance of this issue... Are, are, you, uh, are you talking about the amendment now? Because that was seconded and that's what's on discussion. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, we've already heard from you, so I just want to make sure everybody has a chance to speak first before I recognize you. Is there a, a point of information? Did the no? I did the, was it possible to call for a table? That was all I asked. That that I don't know what the decision was. It was being researched. Table. Well, the question is, can can it be tabled? Yeah. Um, with regard to the question on tabling. Under Robert's rules, a motion can be made to table a warned article. The question is, is it tabled to the end of the meeting? Is it tabled to the next regular annual meeting or tabled to a special meeting? And voting to table is not a vote on the merits of the question. And to table, which is different than ending debate, technically, requires a majority vote. But usually it's tabled to a date certain, and the date certain can be the next special meeting. But, but, but that's the rule. So it's a motion, has to be seconded. It's 51%, and generally it's to a date certain, including at the end of the meeting. So if there, if there were 12 items, you could move to table question two to the end of the meeting. If there's, an annual, if there's another regular meeting of the body in three months, you could say, I move to table this to the meeting to be held in three months, something like that. But so that, that's the procedure. No, you have to be recognized. And you're not going to get recognized until people who haven't spoken have an opportunity to speak. And then you will get recognized. Because I, I said that in the beginning. Everybody gets to speak at least once. Over there. Hi, my name is Andrew Sullivan. And I'm asking this question on behalf of someone who isn't able to ask it. Um, in the table as proposed, it says, at the, I guess, the fifth topic down. Um, all members by paper or electronic ballot. And someone wanted to know why it says or instead of by mailed or a combination of uh, different methods and electronic. Um, I'd also just like to say that it seems like this uh, bylaw change proposal there, there seems to be so much confusion about it, it should at the very least be tabled. Um, and I, I, I don't see how it could be approved tonight um, with everyone feeling confident that it, there's clarity. OK. Thank you. I, I believe the language, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the language in there is because the co-op no longer mails ballots. That's why you don't see the word mail ballot in there. That was decided a few years ago for um, financial, among other reasons. You've already been heard from, so please wait. Go ahead. Hi, Stephanie Boucher. Um, I have a kid downstairs. It's after 8 o'clock, and I think we're all really tired. Um, I don't know if people are feeling ready to vote right now or if the tabling is more attractive. But whatever the group wants, like one of those options, I want to make that motion. Well, you have a choice of calling the question or tabling. Do people feel ready to vote on this? Yes. Call the question, is that what I call it? That means vote? I'd like to call the question. OK. <laughs> um, the question is called, is there a second? This is, we, we're still talking about the amendment. Yes, we're still talking about the amendment. So we're voting on whether or not to adopt the amendment, and this would need a 90% uh, approval. An amendment needs a 90% approval. No, she didn't call the question on the debate. She called the question on on the question on the floor. Do you, where did where'd you go?
Hey, Michael, Michael, Mike, John Bravent. Okay. There's, an, uh, there's a motion on the floor. We're only allowed to speak to the motion that's on the floor. The motion was to amend as described by right. the- Right, and I believe the and question- And so that's, so the question that was called, the only question that can be called is to the motion that is presently on the floor, and it's right. the motion to amend as described. So yes. we're voting on the amendment. Exactly, yeah. that's Robert's rules. Yeah, thank you. Yes, it was, and it was seconded. She stood up there and made the motion, and it was seconded. That's what we're doing. We are voting on the amendment. The amendment will require a 90% approval from the people in this room voting. And that's what we're doing right now. So we're gonna do it by voice and see how that sounds. And then, Eva, do you have something that just can't wait? Can you re repeat the amendment just so that everybody's clear about- Stephanie, can you repeat your amendment in front of a microphone? No, no, she's calling the question. So, okay. I, okay, I was unaware that I was calling for a vote on the amendment. I mostly just wanted to vote on this bylaw change proposal. You, you can't vote I on the bylaw. I understand now that I couldn't have yes. called that at this point. But you can I call just, the amendment, which moves us towards voting which on the- Which moves us forward, which yes. is great. <laughs> okay. So Stephanie, please restate the amendment, which we will be voting on. Um, the motion is to, on the table that the council proposed, that table, that to go to the first column, to the topic, to exchange pledge mortgage or sell all or substantially all of the assets of the cooperative, and the next block to materially expand the cooperative's building structure. With respect to those two, go over to the third column under voter participation and strike what it says, which is all members by paper or electronic ballot. That's what it says under both of those. And to substitute members attending an annual meeting or a specially called meeting by floor vote. The same language as in the four topics above. And also in the next column entitled voting period, to strike to be determined by council and to insert at the annual meeting or specially called meeting. And this would bring back these two issues to discuss, debate, and vote at a meeting. That's okay. the motion. Is that clear for everybody? Because all we're doing now is voting. We're not talking about anything unless something is unclear. Okay, I don't want comments. I just want, if you're unclear about what we're voting on, you can ask a question. Otherwise, we're voting. Brenda Thal, being that so many people have left, do we still have a quorum where we can legally vote on this at this point? I believe we only needed a quorum when the meeting began in Pardon. order to conduct business. Is that correct? Excuse me, I can't hear you. Yeah, we only need a quorum when the meeting opens in order to conduct business. It doesn't require a quorum at the time of a particular vote. That's really not fair. Well, it's, it's just how it's stated. Um, that uh, Michael's correct with regard to a general meeting under Robert's rules, but under municipal law, you have to have a quorum present throughout the town meeting or school board meeting to vote on anything to be binding. But under Robert's rules, you don't. So can I ask a question? So, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, you just got to read. Okay, all right, so here is yet another civics lesson for me and probably some of you. The question has been called, which means first, 
we have to vote on whether or not you are ready to call the question, and that requires a two-thirds vote. If you say yes, let's call the question, then we will vote on the amendment. If you say no, we're not ready to call the question, the question goes on. So let's vote on calling the question. You can just give me an I or an A. Okay, if, wait, wait, hold. If you are ready to call the question, please say aye. Aye. And if you are opposed, please say nay. Okay, so the question is called. Now we are going to vote on the amendment, and uh, this is going to require 90% of the room. So we're going to try a voice vote first. If you are in favor of the amendment that Stephanie Kaplan put forward and read just a few minutes ago, then please say aye. Aye. And if you are opposed, please say nay. All right, I think we're going to need to count cards on that one because it's a 90% threshold. So green cards, green cards up first. Keep them up for another minute so we can get a count. against. Okay, so the amendment fails. It didn't reach the 90%. Now we are back to the question. 98 to 42, I believe is what Kari said. 101 to 42 was the vote. Um, so now we're back to the question, the original question, the proposal on whether or not to adopt this bylaw change. It requires a simple majority of the people in the room, but um, it's still on the floor for debate unless I hear otherwise. <laughs> Call the questions. There a second. You're right. You're right. Okay. Um, is there somebody who hasn't spoken? You? <laughs> 
All right, all right, I'm not gonna argue with you, Alex. It's not worth it. Thank you. I think we need to vote this down. I think it's well-intentioned. There are anomalies in here. Number one under quorum, which is not being changed, still references mail ballot, which apparently nobody wants to use. There is no reference to electronic ballot in either one or two. There needs to be some reference to electronic ballot. We need to give a lot of thought to how do we get people to have an opportunity to weigh in on important issues like selling the assets of the co-op or expanding the co-op. Maybe it's electronic and me dealing with it at an annual meeting, but so far it doesn't seem like the homework's been done and I would suggest we vote it down and if people want to be involved in a bylaw committee, I was involved in a bylaw committee with the Washington Electric Co-op a long time ago, there may be some more wisdom that needs to be brought to this well-intentioned effort. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is Stephen Farnham. I'm one of the people who served on the committee that uh, ultimately moved this to the council and then for approval. And um, I'd like to uh, speak to what Alex just said, that it was not uh, well thought through. Uh, I couldn't disagree more. We put a great deal of time into this. Um, as far the one piece of that that could be true is it wasn't well thought through how we could connect with the group. By the group, I mean everyone here tonight. Uh, it would seem that there was a communications failure there. But we are looking at a situation where I think there's a bit of a catch-22 or you're asking us to do something which is impossible. Um, how many people would agree, regardless of your philosophical ideas of whether or not it's a equal representation, whether or not you re agree that it states the same thing, does anyone in this room disagree that this tabular format is easier to read? Okay, and so my point is, we spent an awful lot of time being buried in page after page and paragraph after paragraph of bylaws old and new and amendments old and new to figure out how the original document with amendments added, what that equals in the end. And our interpretation is it equaled this. Now, that's okay to disagree with that. But the next problem comes in, in which is to provide a means by which all of you can understand how we arrived there. That has to happen in a half an hour at an annual meeting when we spent months working on this thing. It's not possible to go over this in a half an hour. It's not possible to tell you all the nuances that we went through. What I would, and I have many times when people take me aside and say, you know, what's going on in the council? What are you guys working on? Or what, what's up with this bylaw change? I've said, come to the meetings, hear what we say. There are two or three of us that fought long and valiantly to get all of the council meetings recorded and put on the website. And it was a tough fight because a lot of people didn't want that to happen. We have those recordings posted. You can listen to our discussions now. And still we get to hear and we're soundly chastised for what we tried to do. I came into this uh, group three years ago. I'm hoping to stay in it, but that'll be up to your vote. Uh, with the idea that we needed to open up this channel of communication. And I think we've all tried to do that. But if you choose to vote this down, it would be nice if, as a footnote, we could learn from you exactly how you want us to communicate with you. Do we, what do we need to do so that you understand where we're going with this and we can head this off long before we get to here? Because there's no point in taking all this time to try to bring something to you and then have you say, uh, sorry, we don't understand it, so we don't, we're not in favor of it. Um, I guess that's the upshot of what I wanted to say. I will, in closing, I just wanted to make one other comment. I've heard a lot of different things about this whole process. And I'll say that I've, through three years, I've had a, bit of, a bunch of disagreements with different individuals. But I have never, ever doubted the commitment of my colleagues on this council to this organization. 
I, regardless whether you agree with where they're going, I think they all are really trying to do the right thing. Thank you. Is there anybody in the room who feels like they need more discussion before they're ready to vote on this question? Okay, there's a difference at this point in the night, I just want to point out that there is a difference between wanting to say something and really adding something germane to the conversation. And that's why I'm asking, are there people in the room who feel like they need more discussion in order to be ready to vote on this? We could spend all night here listening to people, and I love the democratic process, but I'm also hearing and feeling from people like, Do you have something to add that's, all right. It's hard to do. All right, so first of all, I wanted to thank you for all the work that you did in organizing this table, and I'm sure that you worked very, very hard to make sure to transfer all the information from the long bylaws into the table. I love organizing things myself as a science teacher, um, and tables are great for that. However, um, not being a lawyer, but being able to read, like we've been mentioning it a lot, um, I don't think it just translates everything into that table. You, you have... You are being a little bit rude, and I was not being rude at all. Um, May I finish? Yes. Please do not take the phone away from me. I'll give, you right, I'll give it right back to you. I'm not trying to be rude at all, and I apologize if you felt that way. What I am trying to do is be sensitive to the whole room. And I believe... Okay, so I want you to finish, but I'm asking everybody in their mind, before they feel like they need to come to the microphone at this point in the evening, if you are not adding something new, then maybe it's just time to, that's fine. I'm gonna to listen to what you have to say. Thank you. Um, I think that um, seeing this table and reading um, and putting more information to this table, it could definitely fit it. We could use smaller print to make sure that we include everything from the former bylaws that would include more methods for communication, which everybody seems to agree is a great thing, and include that in all those votes would be to use this wonderful table that the council members worked so hard on and to add to it from the striked out parts so that we have more methods of communication and not less. And I don't think it would take away from the clarity of the table for a future time um, when we get to vote on it once it's more complete. And I'm sorry, did you tell us your name? Ella Malamud. Thank you. So, is there anybody else who would like to speak? Hi, Linda Kelly. I was on the council from 2011 to 2014. I'd like to ask that we either not vote on this or that the count or that we table it, because I think the council should consider removing any requirement that any vote is limited to voting at an annual meeting with only the people who are present. We are a cooperative. We are a cooperative of 8,600 members. We have a fire code limit that only allows us to have, what, 300 people here? That's 3%. So unless you want to be an elitist oligarchy and require that decisions get made only at an annual meeting, then you will vote, then the, we will ask the council to consider amending so that votes take place by in-person or electronic ballots or at an annual meeting. Very inclusive. I'm just about sick of it. That's mine? Yep. Am I recognized? Hi. Yeah, Joan Stepensky. Um, I would just like to say that I spent uh, the, the minutes here in the meeting uh, looking through this and uh, mapping the, mapping the uh, eight items to the bylaws and looking at it very carefully. And as far as I can see, this is uh, quite a complete, maybe not to the word, but to the idea. Uh, a translation from this rat's nest to this table and I think what it what it does is reveal that there are probably some good places to make 
bylaw changes, but I think basically what this has done is clarify what is actually said in these bylaws. There may be a couple of word changes, like the business of mailed ballots, but I don't know, I, I tried to account for every item. And if you want to look at my scratches, you're welcome. Thank you. A very brief comment. Um, I don't think this has been said. In the last two years of discussion, a strong uh, impression that I came away from the meetings was that there was a, uh, an, a preference on the part of management and um, the uh, council that the number of participatory opportunities by which the members could weigh in upon our um, conduct of our co-op um, would be decreased in some fashion um, and that the co-op management be able to shape the dialogue by um, emphasizing a remote ballot by which the issues would be framed by the management. The other members who might have a different opinion would not have access to the same conduits to reach the membership. Um, and as a consequence, the management would have a greater chance of creating the kind of uh, co coherent, uh, coherent message that would lead the, the membership as a whole to vote, even if they were not present or did not, either could not or would not be at these meetings. And I'm hearing again, in looking at this table, a, a, just a different method to reduce in-person membership participation, which I think is one of the key aspects. I'm not saying we shouldn't vote electronically. I'm saying I would very much be suspicious of efforts to reduce through language, through clarification, through whatever it's called, the number of uh, me means by which the membership can weigh in upon large questions before our co -op. So my name is Ashley Hill, and I am the vice president of your co-op. And, and I'm really struggling. I've been sitting up here diligently trying to take notes to make sure that I capture what everyone here is saying. And I am, I'm truly offended to hear that, that there are people in this room that think that all of us that serve here on this council, that serve all of you and that represent all of you in council meetings at the co-op don't want involvement. And I can assure you that I have been serving on this council with these folks here for several years at this point and every single one of us wants to hear from people. And any assertion to the contrary tonight is deeply offensive to all of us. And I am so heartened to see all of you here tonight and I appreciate how important this co-op is to all of us but I want you to be involved and every single member of this co-op council wants you to be involved and I commend all of you for taking your time and still sitting here with us through all of this discussion some of which has become heated and and somewhat offensive and and I appreciate the sentiment behind it and I appreciate all of the work that has gone in in sharing your thoughts and your opinions and I encourage all of you to continue to engage in that and to do so respectfully and if you have questions or concerns about whether you feel like your council isn't responding to your needs or your wishes or your desires for your co-op, please reach out to us because I assure you we are here to listen and we are here to work for all of you. Thank you. John and then Ellen. I will, I will be brief in the interest of time. Um, I'm gonna vote no on this motion and primarily because of all the confusion around this and it's, there's no fault here. It was a best attempt. I, I, I've known Steve Farnham forever. He's an honest, straightforward guy, love him. Um, but I think there's a lot of confusion unintended. Um, what Stephanie Kaplan said is, is the case. Um, and I just like just to bend here just for another minute. When our legislature over under the Golden Dome, men's law, they don't always get it right, just like our council doesn't get it perfectly. And so what happens is you oftentimes will have a new amendment to, to a statute of law that can be read in conflict with existing law. And there's a rule of statutory construction 
Statutes are laws. Bylaws are the laws of this co-op. These are our statutes, folks. The rule of statutory construction, which I would argue applies here very clearly, is where you can read two statutes or two portions of the same statute in conflict, or you can read them under another interpretation to work together. The rule is you need to read them to work in concert with each other. If you cannot do that, if they're mutually exclusive, no matter how you view that, those two provisions of law, then it's the newer law that presides. That's not the case here. This existing bylaw that's being proposed to be amended here can be read to cooperate. The first half that struck the first paragraph and the second paragraph, they can be read to work together. And the, the, the collective work together interpretation would be to allow for issues of this level of consequence, such as selling our cooperative, to be held at an annual meeting. That's how you read it together. The changes here would actually, actually be a change to our laws. It would mean that you can only read it one way. It would not be at an annual meeting any longer. It would only be by electronic ballot or paper ballot, I think, I don't know, whatever else it says on there. Um, and, and I will cede the mic to whoever's next, but for those who were around, for those who were around back in the early 90s, Howard Dean was governor. The Cabot Cooperative Creamery was owned, just like our little cooperative, Hunger Mountain Cooperative. It was owned by our Cabot, Marshfield, Walden, Hardwick Farmers. They owned it. And through changes to their bylaws, the board accrued power. Now, that was a really good board. Everyone trusted them. But then new people got in there, and they got a business manager in there. And he worked a deal, and he almost sold that co-op to a private corporation whose number one business interest was buying co-ops in small businesses around the country and dismantling them. That's what he did. It was stopped by the membership going to federal court. But the, it got so far down that track because the membership wasn't queued in to the level that they, we would be having these annual meeting type votes um, that they had to sell. They got so in debt, legal costs and everything, and they wound up selling to Agrimark, Agrimark Co-op. There was a federal lawsuit. Members were saying, we need to know what the salaries are and the expenses are and everything else. And um, I'm getting told to sit down by a rude member. Um, but uh, the federal court ruled that the, the Agrimark Cooperative is actually a private corporation doing business under co-op rules. So they are no longer a co-op. And this happened because the membership said we don't need to have that control. We trust our board. And I trust this board, but I don't know who might inherit this board in 10 years. And I'll leave it at that. I ask that you vote no. Thank you. Carl Etnayer, um, member of the council for one year. Prior to that, I was on the bylaws committee. I worked with Stephanie and Billy Donovan and others two years ago to vote down the proposed change on how our bylaws were amended because it was not participatory enough. It would have taken the power away from this meeting. I, when I initially looked at this table, had the same reaction as Stephanie. This is a substantive change, looking at the plain text of the bylaws. I wrote a two or three page memo explaining that, and then I looked back at the history and what happened in 2003 and saw, okay, now I understand what they were trying to do, I understand why those amendments were poorly crafted, and the intent the last time that the co-op voted on these issues, the co-op voted because they were angry about what happened at annual meeting to expand the conversation and the voting to all members. Be that as it may. Given the conversation that we've heard here tonight, and also given that our bylaws are messed up in a lot of ways. If you spend the hours and hours over the years that I've spent with these bylaws, you find typos, you find things that are unclear, you find a silly order to things. Maybe we need to 
listen to the folks who are saying, let's get a committee together, let's spend time together over the next year and come with a bunch of well-explained amendments to the bylaws next year that are a bigger package than this and spend more time, maybe like the community conversations that we've had over the last year. Uh, can you get Ellen a microphone? Uh, Ellen Knadler, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but I would like to call the question for a vote. Proposal on proposal number two. I think that is appropriate. Do we have a second? And Stephen Klein seconded. All right. Now, see, I've already learned my civics. So now I know that we need to vote on call to question and that it's a two-thirds vote of the House. Whew. All right. So <clears throat> let's do an I and an A. Voice vote. If you are in favor of calling the question, please say aye. Aye. If you are opposed, please say nay. <laughs> Well, there's your 90%. <laughs> All right. So then we are going to vote on the question. The question requires a simple majority of the people who are still in the room. And we will also do this on an I or a nay. So if you are in favor of the proposal number two, as stated in the uh, co-op mailing, please say I. If you are opposed to proposal number two, please say nay. Nay! I would say that's pretty clear that the nays are the majority. So we have concluded the bylaws section. Now, I, I do want to remind people of two things. First of all, I do want to apologize. I, I definitely lost it there in the middle, and I particularly apologize to you. Um, but what I was going to say is there's going to be a, a speaker and a short presentation as your agenda carries, and then the raffle, and you do have to be present to win the raffle. So just, oh, I mean, the raffle, that's called a raffle, right? Yeah, the raffle. So just keep that in mind, and thank you all for being part of democracy. Thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate that. Um, we now want to introduce, <laughs> I don't know where I start with this actually. Do you, do you, are we gonna hop over the video? <laughs> okay, uh, we're not doing the video. Um, Allison, should I just bring Allison up? I, I wanna introduce Allison Levin, who is gonna talk to us about gleaning. And she, it, it's so fun, it's so uplifting, so. Uh, I'm not a comedian, so sorry, I can't entertain you more, but um, I'll do what I can here. So um, the next slide would be great. So I'm Allison Levin from Community Harvest of Central Mount, the founding director of the program. Um, back one slide. Do you have another one there, Kari? No. Uh, there we go. Oh, that, that one would be great. Thank you. So let's change the subject just for a second, and I will be very brief um, tonight. So. Um, gleaning dates back um, to biblical times, as many of you may know, this painting may be familiar as well, um, but in the last 10 to 20 years it's become more popular as we focus on envir the environment and wasting less and um, our focus on, on that has become more popular in the last few years. And we are, uh, we consider gleaning to be recovering the surplus food from local farms, the food that would otherwise still be nutritious, but the farmers are not able to sell. And that is the focus of our organization, and we've been partnering for the co-op for a number of years now. So if you'd like to go to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, gleaning is really our way to bring the community together on a, as a community activity and um, share and learn together while we're doing good in, in the community. So. Um, we have been, um, this is only our fourth season 
Um, we started the program four years ago with an idea of one or two people in a Subaru wagon, and um, now in our fourth season, we now work with over two to 300 volunteers and provide food to 7,000 um, community members who would otherwise have um, limited access to fresh local food. So we're making a big impact in the community. We also last year were able to build our own um, cooler, all with volunteer support, that we put the food in that we've been collecting each week before our volunteers deliver it to um, our partner organizations. So there's a picture of the cooler and, and a lot of dedication that went into building that. So beyond that, we now partner with 30 farms. Originally, we started out with one farm, and we work um, all throughout Washington County, and we have provided 300,000 servings of fresh local food to community members in need. So that's a, it's a pretty big number. Um, and we, um, sorry, getting distracted here. Um, so those, all those servings of food get distributed to our partner organizations, um, 16 to 20 organizations throughout Washington County, also the Vermont Food Bank, um, when we don't have um, sites locally to distribute to, food shelves, senior meal programs. Many of you um, are involved in the work of some of those organizations and um, get the food that we provide, all organizations feeding people with limited access to fresh local food. Next slide, thank you. So our focus here, as I said, was in Washington County, and where a study found recently that almost one million pounds of produce grown but not eaten from local farms every season. Um, so that the, the produce that we're recovering, we're only making a dent in that. And we're part of a wider um, network of organizations statewide, nationally and internationally, all working um, on the gleaning effort to keep food from going to waste. Um, we're part of what's called the Vermont Gleaning Collective, which is a group of six to seven other organizations around the state, which was started by Salvation Found Farms. It's a network of professionally organized community-based gleaning programs that um, work to make sure that the surplus from these farms, this 14.3 million pounds every season, uh, we can at least recover some of that and feed all those people in our communities that don't have enough access to the food that is being sold at the co-op. So you might be asking, how, the, how does this really work? So we, um, it requires a lot of coordination. That's really about what we do. And we start by being contacted by a farm who might have finished their field of onions that they're harvesting, but there's still some left for us to glean. Then we work with the volunteers to try to get them out to glean in the field with us. You can see the picture at the top. Um, to recover those onions. In the case of onions, we take them into the barn and cure them so that they'll be easier to clean and send to senior meal programs and food shelves. The chefs really prefer when we don't give them dirty onions to put on their cutting boards. Um, so we like to clean those and, and make sure they're ready for the site. Um, but again, it's all um, not quite as simple as it may look and all the components need to work together and it's really about having those partnerships set up ahead of time, those partnerships with the farms, with all of the volunteers and the recipients to make the process work and about the coordination and that's what we do um, at Community Harvest. So we're now at this point looking ahead to how we can involve the community more in the years to come and build on our successes that we've had in the first four seasons of our program. Next slide, thank you. So you may be asking after this long evening, what can I do to be involved in this? Or maybe what can I do to get home? But, <laughs> but in this case, um, I wanted to, to mention and you know, thank the co-op for the years of support that all of you have given our program already. Um, we have partnered in a number of ways and I won't go into those right now. I'm happy to chat with you at some point about those. I will be at the food fair on Saturday if you want to come chat with me then because I know you don't want to chat with me tonight. <laughs> Um, but all through October, um, we've been the Giving Change recipient at the co-op, and that goes through this Sunday. So if you'd like to give change um, to our organization, you can still do that. Um, we appreciate all those donations. Also, um, we, you can become an outreach volunteer um, and volunteer with our organization on behalf of the co-op, and you can get um, a discount for doing that if you don't already receive one. Um, 
and also other ways you can get involved are encouraging your local farmers to petition participate with our organization and, and work with us to recover this food that they can't sell. Um, adding um, our organization, Community Harvest, to your yearly giving would be appreciated. Um, also supporting our requests from local towns to get on the ballot for um, funding requests um, for a little bit that we um, ask for them. So, and I don't know if we're gonna take any questions. If anyone has a really quick question, I'm happy to answer them, but uh, Kari. What's your biggest need? Our biggest need. Um, it changes moment to moment. Um, I would say probably funding is always the biggest need, but money. Um, we're looking to bring more food into this county. We don't have as many farms here, so we've been partnering with other organizations in parts of the state, and so we're looking at a new initiative that um, we might be able to do that, and so that would be something we'd love to have some more funding for. I'm the only staff person for the organization, so um, it will be help to have a little bit more funding to make ability to grow and expand. All right, thank you, you've been very patient. I'm just gonna make a few thank yous and then we'll um, go to the raffles. So first of all, I'd like to thank Lost Nation Theater for hosting us tonight. I'd like to thank uh, Foley for donating the linens. The music was provided by Dana Robinson and R.D. Eno. Photography by Curtis Johnson. The child care providers were Rhonda Brace, Chris Parker, Alex Smart, and Sadie Chase Tatko. I want to thank all the staff and the member owners who helped set up the room and are going to clean up after. And then tomorrow we're going to turn the room over and it's going to be the Food and Wellness Fair on Saturday. And most uh, importantly, I want to thank the Community Relations and Member Services team, Crystal Fuller, Stephanie Canona, and Robin Joy, Jess Knapp, Mary Trafton, for putting this sort, uh, event together. Gonna thank you to all the um, organizations and people that donated us raffle prizes, which we'll do in just a moment. Can we have one more hand for the uh, prepared foods team, including Chef Doug Barg for dinner tonight? <laughs> the alcoholic beverages were provided by Cast Iron. I want to thank Claire Wheeler and the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Fund Committee. Special thank you to Allison. And I also want to acknowledge we have three outgoing council members. So if you would come up when I say your name, Rita Rickardson, please. <laughs> Rita served on the council from 2003 to 2006, and then she came back in 2012. She has served on uh, countless committees. I don't think we can count that high. Um, and, and a secretary. I know at least that much. Maybe treasurer at some point. Um, Rita's very good at asking probing questions. She um, is very insightful and wise. And she's also very skilled at identifying where the bridges are and, and um, uh, bringing us together when there appeared to be differences. So we're really going to miss Rita, and we thank you very much. certificate for you and a, um, on the back is a gift card to Bear Pond Books. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Our second outgoing council member is Marcy Young. Marcy can't be here tonight. She has moved to Montana. So Marcy served the past two years. She brought a lot of passion for community and for uh, environmental values. And she really pressed us, she pressed me specifically to use more data when it came to environmental, as you saw some of that tonight. Uh, specifically, she was interested in using comparative data, so I really thank her for that. And um, uh, wish her well living in out west. Uh, so she'll receive a, a certificate and um, a gift card to the Bozeman Co-op where she's moved. <laughs> and finally, I want to acknowledge Alex Brown. Alex has been on the council for five years, including the last four as president. So that makes her the longest serving president in at least the past 15 years. Maybe ever. So Alex is a very skilled, highly skilled writer and a speaker. She's a very innovative thinker. She's devoted to serving the co-op and has worked tirelessly 
um, over these past five years. She's always responsive whenever I need anything, and she's bringing good ideas and good insight. It's been very helpful to me as a, as a leader, and I know the rest of the council. So I have learned a, a tremendous amount um, working with Alex, and I thank you so much and um, wish you well and good luck. Thank you very much. And there's a gift card on the back. Okay, and I also want to acknowledge that uh, we have Stephen Farnham, um, who is running for re-election. I'm not going to presume anything about the uh, outcome of that, but I do thank you, Stephen, for your contributions over the past three years. Good luck. And I want to thank all of the council members um, for their work over the past year. Um, I want to thank the five candidates for council. The votes will be tallied tomorrow, and we'll announce the results post them online and in store. I want to thank you all for coming, and uh, please join us here uh, for the Food and Wellness Fair. So I'm going to turn it over to somebody. Crystal, are you going to do it? Yeah. All right, I'm going to be really quick. I'm not going to be funny. We're just going to do this. We can all go home, right? All business. Um, so the first one is a 45-minute energy genus session with a community link partner of ours, Lucid Path Wellness. And the winner was Mary Lee Wilsnick. Are you still here? You win. It's, it's yours. Uh, and we were like, yeah, did, did you win? No, oh, I'm glad you stayed. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations. The next one is goodies from Vermont 99 Meats that they donated. You'll have to come to the co-op and pick this up because most of it is perishable and half of it's frozen and there's some stuff that's not frozen. So just come to the co-op and ask for me and I'll get it for you. But you have a t-shirt to take. Um, Rob Kidd, are you still here? Of course. All right. It's you. Come to the co-op. Find me. Next is a one-hour self-care assessment with a co-op link, Sherry Reinard. Um, Juliana Westcott, are you still here? Juliana? Going once? Going twice? Okay. Jane Stewart. Nope. Jane Stout. 6166. Are you still here? Yeah. Jane, you win. That's her. Next is this gift basket from Host Defense. Carolyn Moore, are you here? Going once, going twice. Dan Jones? Going once, all right. Um, C. Simpson, member number 1064. Are you here? Going once, going twice? All right, pick a new one. <laughs> Georgina Haas. Yay! I knew she was here. <laughs> All right. This is for the landscape design consultation with a co-op community link, Mammoth Landscape. Amy, I can't read your last name, so I'm going to read your member number. One, two, two, or sorry, two, two, six, six, seven. You're a newer member. Amy Elmlick, going once, going twice. Carolyn Moore is not here. Picking again. Allison, four, nine, five, four. You win. Thanks for hanging in here. See, good things happen when you wait, right? Um, culinary medicine consultation with our co-op community link partner, Lisa Maze. Dan Jones, we know, is not here. Mary Lee Wilsnick, <laughs> you win again. <laughs> um, OK, fair trade basket with $50 from the co-op for produce. You'll get, you get to come to produce and pick out $50 worth of stuff. Eli Frank, going once, going twice. Um, this is just a last name, McLinn, 17060. No, not here, pick again. Ah. George Longnecker, are you here? <laughs> All right, is he here? Yes. Okay, moving on. Citizen Cider, you get a gift card, a tour, some goodies. Carolyn Stevens, are you here? Yes. All right, winner. 
Okay, Nordic Naturals gift basket. Aaron Lane, are you here? Going once, going twice. Dan Jones is not here. Dan Jones would have cleaned house tonight. He is not here. If anyone knows him, you ought to tell him that. Faza? Yes. And I. Here we go. Yes. <laughs> I approved this. She had to go. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Um, this one is a one point, oh, one point five, one and a half hour private session with empowered birth preparation for mom and birth partner with our community links partner, Amy, La Amy pa LaPage and Sally Leahy. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> Sally Leahy. No, nope. you don't want it. Um, Olivia Dunton. Are you still here? She's here? Yay, she wins. <laughs> okay, we've got Joe's Kitchen Screaming Ridge Farm soups. They're in the fridge in the back. So if you win, go to the back and we'll have Robin back there to help you get that stuff. Uh, Michael Sherman, are you here? All right, you win. You can go back to the fridge. Robin will help you out. Um, another co-op community link partner, one and a half hour hypnosis session. Ooh, sounds fun. Um, Avram Pat, are you still here? Going once, going twice. Angie Buckley. I think I saw her leave. Rob Kidd, are you still here or did you leave? <laughs> you are also cleaning house. Okay, we're almost done. Um, Massage Vermont donated a one-hour cranial sacral therapy treatment. And our winner is Amelia Sherman. Going once, going twice. I don't think she's here. David Lathrop, 20641. No? Juliana Westcott, not here. Picking again. Stephanie Boucher? You here? Okay. You win. If you hear your name, yell really loud. $100 gift card to the co-op. Andrew Starzik, are you still here? All right. David Abbott? Pick a new one. Wait. Please don't break down the chairs. Thank you for helping, but we're going to use them tomorrow so you can leave them right where they are. Uh -huh. David, you win. Yeah. You're here. Yes, before we pull that next one. All right, two more to go. This one is the ultimate beer swag raffle. I hope you have room in your car for this canopy because it's going home with you. Um, uh, Cynthia Johnson. Are you here? Yay, so you get all this stuff and this really heavy thing that I'm not gonna move for you. <laughs> we have to get someone else. <laughs> okay, grand prize, drum roll, anyone up for it? Drum roll. This is a two night stay for two people at Trap Family Lodge donated by the Trap Brewery. David Lathrop, are you here? How about Janet Ressler, 398? Yay, Janet! All right, thank you, That's everyone. The end. We have one more piece of business. I need a motion to, ad to adjourn the meeting. Uh, it, Mark Zimikowski, seconded by Ashley. All in favor of adjournment, say aye. aye. Opposed? We are adjourned, thank you again.